tilt headphones are too loud, I can adjust that volume too. If I'm blowing you out or if it's not, if it's not loud enough. You doing them coffees in today or back to the mint? Back to the mint. I didn't like that coffee very much. You like the cinnamon? I haven't tried it. Gotta do it before Democrats ban them. Fuck the Democrats. Here we go. Three, two, one. Boom! And welcome to the Big Honker Podcast brought to you by MLR Graphics. If you need softball, baseball, Little League, MLR Graphics in Breckenridge, Texas, it's MLRGraphics.com, can take care of you and get you suited up for all of your Little League softball needs. Uh, it's that time. Yep. How is your baseball team doing? <clears throat> Uh, we got our first game next week. You got some pitching though, right? I got, I got, I got kids that can bring the heat. That's that's the key to the whole deal. Heat and a little bit of movement. Oh, so we're throwing some no hitters. <laughs> Fuck, they all might be. Might you almost, every- you almost threw no hitters last year on a kid pitch. Might walk everybody. With us today, a big some bitch too is in here today from New York. <laughs> got City. a couple big guys yeah, in here. Yeah, but Nathan's not small. Nathan and Tony from Big Country Snake Removal. Is that right? Yes. And Tony, you're from New York City. Yep. The and you're li- living the good life now in God's country in Texas, huh? Yep. Took some getting used to, but yeah. <laughs> you, you miss the food up there? Yes. If there's one thing I miss from New York, for sure, is the food. So a lot of variety. Um, What's your favorite? You don't like our Texas barbecue? Oh, I love Texas barbecue. First time I actually ever had a uh, country fried steak, I was like, and barbecue. I was like, man, this is this is good. But I'll my put favorite, our chicken pe- fry up, yeah. up against. I'd really have, I'm not a big barbecue guy. Pizza? Pizza, probably Fit. pasta, like legit pasta, right? And pizza, because you know, a slice of pizza in New York is an actual slice of pizza, like yes, yeah, it's as big slice. as your head, yeah. So I kind of miss that. There's a lot of variety of food. It's the one thing I miss from from New York for sure. But we eat good in New York for sure. It is a great place, mostly road food or street food. Oh yeah, is really is so good. And of My- course, like a generic, like you know, hot dog. Everyone has to eat from you know. The hot dog stand on the side of the street, you know, yeah. like you've had to, you know, if you're in New York City, you have to. Well, my wife and I, we went there for our honeymoon and I got a chicken kebab off uh-huh. the street, took a bite, and that fucker was raw on the inside. <laughs> it well, it's, like, it's like the hot dogs that they cook at the same hot dogs all day, probably, who right, knows, like two or three yeah, days yeah, in the yeah. same, you know, boiling in that same hot, but I guess that's what gives it the flavor. Have you had the Korean hot corn dog there? No. Nah. My granddaughter wanted a Korean corn dog one time. Let me tell you something. The Koreans are probably good at a lot of things. Corn dogs is not one of them. What do they do? They put shit on them like they're like stuffed with stuff, and on the outside they got Mexican street corn corn dog, which would actually be pretty good, but just weird shit. It just was not. And then when we went to spring break, we went to the mall in Grapevine. First time I've been in a mall in four years. Mannequins have gotten fat since I went to a, man- a mall last time because they used to all be good looking, you know, with yeah. hard nips. Now they're big old fat bitches. I'm like, what the hell? These people are trying to sell just fat people clothes. <laughs> But anyways, they had a cor- Korean corn dog joint in there too. It's just a new kind of. I did not like them. We went all the way from the middle of Manhattan to somewhere on the edge of Manhattan to try a Korean corn dog, and they were not very good. Hmm. Never even heard of one. Well, what I what I miss was having like in Main Street Flush. We have like a uh, little Italy, so you can go you know eat mm-hmm. Italian food, and then you have little China, so you can go eat Chinese food. Mm-hmm. Like there's just a lot of variety. Close I love little. I love Chinatown. Yeah. The, the food we ate there one time. You can really find good. anything in Chinatown. Yes. If you have some random part or whatever that you need, you just go to Chinatown. Oh, they're fuckers or hustlers. Yeah. Oh yeah. And then yeah. I went to Chinatown in San Francisco a couple months ago, and it was the same kind. It was the same exact people. I mean, the same shit everywhere. <laughs> Can't understand a damn sign. They'll take your yeah. money and they'll feed you really good down there. Oh yeah. For we sure. we bought a Louis Vuitton on that trip. A Louis Vuitton. We went to Chinatown. <laughs> Little Chinese lady, you know, they give you like a menu, like you're gonna order a uh, Szechuan or something like that, and picked out what we what she wanted, and um, she's like, okay, follow me, and like we start walking, and I'm a nervous traveler already, and she's like doing this number, she's like on the phone, she's looking back at us, I'm like, we're about to get fucking rolled. He's wearing a white t-shirt. Exactly, yeah, like she, I, you know, she's telling her her pimp daddy like you know what we look like and how much money we got in our wallet, so uh, we're standing there, and she had to go get the purse or whatever, so. We're standing there. We agreed on the price. And then there was a guy wearing like a black trench coat and sunglasses. It looked like he was out of the Matrix. He was like, you can get a better price. Yep. And I was like, what? He's like, you can get a better price. Like, are you a fucking cop? 
Because you got to tell me if you're a cop. That's the rule of being a cop. That's not a rule. <laughs> That's a rule of being no, a cop. Not. So anyway, we're standing there, and I, I, I was like, "You got any? Uh, you got any Roy bands? Roy Ray bands?" And they're like, "Yeah, we got Ray bands." So I had like two pair in my hand. I'm like I'm looking at them, and then I look up, and she's gone. I'm like, "What the fuck? Where'd she go?" Look down the block, and there's a police car rolling up. So I just set those down, slowly walked away. Yeah. It's like when you want to get like uh, movies come out in the theaters, you yeah. know, and they, you know have all the bootleg mm-hmm. stuff laid out in a blanket. They lay it out. You know, if the cops show up, they have... A, I don't know how they do it so quick. They roll that stuff yeah, out real yeah, quick. Yeah, they're yeah. gone. They just, like, disappear amongst all those, you know, three billion people that are there, and they just kind of just... There's disappear. no town like New York City yeah. in America. I we, mean, it's just... It's it's a fun, fun place, or it used to be. We, uh... When the, the original Hangover came out, we got a bootleg copy of it. Mm-hmm. Every high school kid in Knox City, Texas, watched the Hangover at my house the first time. <laughs> I remember the first time Andy put it on, I thought... Cause most comedy is not funny today. It's not nothing like it used to be. Yeah. The Hangover is funny as shit. So I watched it 10 times in a week with about 13 fucking different kids at my house. <laughs> when you day. get a good bootleg copy, there's not much difference. Like when you first watch it, you're like, ah, oh, this kind of, it's kind of grainy and, you know, somebody keeps standing up. But like you start to ignore all that shit, you know, like if it's a good bootleg copy. But I've seen some bootleg copies that are just bad. Yeah. Lips are off of, from what they're saying. You're like, oh, Jesus Christ. Now, Who put this film together? When, when you were living in New York City, did the Halal Brothers have the chicken stands all over the place? I don't think so. Oh, man, that's that's good eating. That was one thing I different. I noticed was the um, Muslim influence in Manhattan on the Halal. Yeah. That shit's good. This is as good a chicken as I've ever had anywhere. Yeah, when I was living there, it was mostly, I would say, in Corona, Queens, was definitely a lot of Dominican population. Then towards the end, a lot of Mexican. So I would say probably a lot of, uh, definitely Hispanics, but um, definitely a lot of Me- Dominican and uh, Mexican. There's a show on Netflix I want to watch. It's uh, New York Homicide. I just watched it. Was it any good? The first ones, I only watched the first ones. The uh, the deli murder at, uh, what the hell is that big deli? It's out Carnegie? of business now. Carnegie Deli, which is no longer in business. So I guess the cops, there's there's North to Texas and there's South to Texas. And the 59th Street is the cutoff mm-hmm. line. So, but I, what is the show? It's like just basically this the, was the two a, different homicide units. This was a documentary. The only first one I watched, I watched it last night, was the um, Northern, was the, if I can't remember, it was North or South, wherever Carnegie Deli is. But it was the murderer there. There was a lady that was selling weed that lived in an apartment up above it, like on the fifth floor. And she had a song studio and stuff. And two guys came in and whacked her. Yeah. She was dating a black guy because he met the description of the uh, the guy who actually did the killing. He black guy with dread. So they thought he did it. And he's like, listen, I didn't want nothing to do with that shit. But it's a bad drug deal. Basically, it popped five people in the head. And it just follows like the homicide. Like, it is it a series? It shows the actual. No, it shows the actual. No, is it a murder series? Tri- yeah, there's eight of them. There's eight episodes. But it shows the actual murder and how they did it and all the, the shit that they do to. You know, the difference between getting by with a murder. Well, first, you got to be a fucking Democrat and you get by with anything. But one fucking little fucked up deal changes a whole. That's how they catch people. One little thing, does, right. you know, catches you something. So your name's on a piece of paper in their apartment or some shit. Oh, yeah. It's just crazy how they, because you would think in New York City would be the best place to kill somebody and get away with it because you can blend in because there's people everywhere. Well, and now it's cell phones. Everything pings off. Like if your cell phone pings around well, there, there's a tower. Yeah, they could find yeah. out if you. As people so, are so yeah. connected with their cell phone. If so you're going to commit a crime, leave your cell phone at home. Yeah. Yep. Well, that's how they caught that guy in Idaho that killed that sorority. Did, you, did y'all hear about that? The uh, guy um, stabbed it, him. It was in Idaho, and he killed like an entire sorority. It wasn't a sorority house, but it was like four girls that were living there. Yeah. Broke in. They had a sliding glass door on the on the lower level. Slid it open, and it was pretty gruesome. But that's how they caught him. His cell phone had been pinging. Like, he was scouting those girls. So, like, they got him and the area for, like, two weeks up until the time of the murder. And and then got his ass. But I bet you thought we were going to talk about snakes, huh? Okay. You know, <laughs> early. Are there are there any snakes in the Bronx? That's what I was How wondering. the hell does a they guy don't... from the Bronx? <laughs> that was my question. That was your lead-in? Ah, yeah. So, that's a very good question. I actually don't. So, I started out, man, started out, obviously liking animals I, but it was i was so young that i don't even remember honestly this pictures you know when i was a kid you know when i was just kind of walking around you know you know in underwear and you know diapers and i've always been fascinated by wildlife so i always had little cages little critter keepers and insects and any you know native animals that i can catch 
as I grew older, um, I really loved visiting zoos. So obviously, the Bronx Zoo was a big one. I pretty much grew up in that zoo, um, Prospect Park Zoo, Bronx Zoo. And reptiles always caught my attention. Um, I was always fascinated by reptiles. And as I just grew up, it became more of an obsession and a fascination. I kept them. Um, I would travel to upstate New York because, you know, five boroughs, you're not going to find anything. I mean, there's really, no really, snakes in they, New York I mean, City, though, they, is there? They are. It's certain like parks, you know, like if you go to Central Park, you know, you might find a garter snake if you're lucky. But it's not it's not a high population of, of snakes in New York City. It's more like you start going upstate, you know, you get more woods and, you know, and trees and things. What like kind that. of snakes do they have upstate New York? It's so damn cold. Oh, actually, we have two native species of venomous snakes. We have timber rattlesnake and the northern copperhead. They are black rat snakes, hognose snakes, garter snakes. So not as much as Texas, but there's a few. Um, they have they're very to uh, cold tolerant, obviously, which is why they can live there. But we don't have the variety up in New York the way we do, um, obviously, in Texas. But um, grew up and uh, you know got a job at uh, several zoos, kept a lot of snakes. But my obsession with with snakes and animals started at a very young age. Um, I would also travel uh, to Puerto Rico. Um, my grandparents are Puerto Rican, so we would travel to Puerto Rico, I would catch lizards and snakes and things like that. So while people were playing sports and, you know, doing, you know, boy things, I was out lost in the woods somewhere. Parents would get pissed well, off because, you know, I was gone and they couldn't find me. We were in Puerto Rico a couple, couple years ago, and where our house was, we... we we weren't in the country, but we weren't in San Juan. We were in uh, Rio Grande. I uh -huh. think is the name of the place. But we would go to, if you'd go to town for something, and we were right on the water. There would be people with flashlights in the woods and shit, like on this road. I'm a nosy son of a bitch, so I had to stop and ask what the hell they were doing. And they were getting crabs. They were inland crabs, and these suckers were big, mean yeah, son of bitches. Yeah, they're huge. And so what they'll do is they'll make a, a rice out of them with the meat. It's actually really good. And they're huge. They all have the big claws. Yes. Um, and so there's a lot of markets on the side of the street, kind of like New York City, with uh, when they sell hot dogs. And they'll kind of hang the crabs up, and uh, people just go outside of the road, and they buy them. They make food. I mean, rice. They mix them with rice and all sorts of dishes. Yeah, the guy was telling me how much, like, one crab's worth, like, 50 bucks. Yeah. And I was like, shit. I wish I had tried that because I had a, a crab rice dish in Lake Tahoe that I really liked. I love San Fr I, I love Puerto Rico. I just wasn't a big fan of the food there. I like Mexican food yeah. a whole lot more than I did Puerto Rican food, but Puerto Rico is a beautiful place. It is. It is. I mean, I haven't been there in a while, but there's been a lot of lot of changes and stuff like that. But um, but yeah, it's a an interesting place for sure. So San Juan, I would definitely, especially old San Juan, I would definitely watch my pockets when you're walking around. Yeah, all we went. We were there for an afternoon. <laughs> I didn't feel uncomfortable didn't feel there, but we. Did. I mean, we did I kind didn't. of the touristy stuff, and you know, we weren't there for very long. How did you find Tony? It was kind of a <laughs> kind of a weird weird thing. There was a guy that was kind of into reptiles yeah. around Abilene and he kind of piggybacked off me to try to get more information and find these some of the rare animals around Abilene and he was friends with him. So it just kind of came together that way. And then that guy actually moved off to Cal California. California or something and him and I started hanging out a little bit more. Obviously, we're both pretty obsessed with snakes, and I just do not get this. Is it you're Oof. obsessed with snakes? Like, mm, just it's just probably unhealthy. Really, that bad? We, but like that, being afraid of snakes is like at the deepest level of being of a human being. Like that's what preyed upon us when we were, you know, early man. Like we're we're afraid of three things: big cats, big birds, and big snakes. And you're hunting them. You hunt birds, not big birds. What's a big bird? Well, like you know, I mean, a pterodactyl. They've been gone a while. You well, know, <laughs> we don't know how long, but like it's ingrained in us, and like you just never have been afraid of. Like even even to your earliest memories, you mm -hmm. never were afraid of snakes. Never. Did you read the Bible part where it turned it turned Adam and Eve kind of screwed screwing the whole world up right there? Mm -hmm. What what okay, you said rare animals in Abilene? What is a rare Abilene an animal in Abilene? I probably shouldn't have said rare. They're they're common but uncommonly seen. So you can talk about like the Central Plains milk snakes. They have very small pockets uh, where they where they actually are, and you have to go and you have to lift rocks at the right time of the year and find them underneath the rocks. It's just not something that most people dedicate enough time to 
to do, and most people don't even know they exist in these areas. But they're they're. What is a milk snake? Uh, I'm assuming not venomous. No, they're not venomous. Uh, I got pictures of them. I can show you later. They're red, white, and black banded. Make you shit your pants. Yeah, because that's what they do to me. Here's the video of Jeff. So uh, <laughs> we were we we started um, we started. Let me see. I can I can get sound here in just a second. Um, during renovations, so we always. <clears throat> we'll always kind of get the lodge up and running um, because people don't stay in these rooms, uh, you know, during our off season months. So um, started doing it and there was a hog nose snake on right there. That, oh, do that, that door right there coming in that y'all came in and uh, I don't know where's the sound. Uh, oh, the cl click on the arrow up above. Oh, there it is right, right there. Tony thought it'd be funny to call me to come out. I wish that somebody should have bit him on his damn ankle while he's fucking with me. But hognos are pretty docile, aren't they? Yeah. They're all pretty much bluff. Show. Hey, yeah. Well, they look like a cobra, right? Whenever you agitate them? They, they can spread a, uh, a hood, but a lot of it is just huffing and puffing, and they'll they'll play dead um, as well. It's A lot of it is just for show. Tony's putting a hot water heater in. It's explosive. Oh, God <laughs> That's Jeff's reaction anytime there's a snake. But you know, it might as well have been a cobra. <laughs> wow. Yeah, See? That scared the shit out of me. I'm telling you right now. My dog, you know, scared the Ollie dog too. Yeah, I don't but I'm I'm with Jeff. And you know, the element of surprise. The element of surprise. So snakes are coming out of their dens right now, or they're staying pretty close? They're staying pretty close. They're poking their heads out on the warmer days and starting to bask a little bit, and that's going to boost their metabolism so they can start processing food and go through that. So during the winter months, do they just go into like a state of hibernation where they don't have to have any calories? Yeah, that's pretty much what it is. They, they metabolize what they have, the fat that they have stored in their tails. So in their tails? Mm -hmm. That's where they store their fat, and that's what they'll, their body feeds on while they're under there in that dormant state. You know what's crazy is, is I've seen videos of rats running around dormant snakes in the winter, like in a cellar or something. Mm -hmm. Snakes ain't very, I mean, the rats ain't very damn smart. That's somebody's going to eat his ass in a couple of months. Probably, yeah. Probably. <laughs> Probably. And he just runs around them rattlesnakes while they're laid up. I was under a house, where was that? Uh, maybe Paducah, somewhere up there. And there were several rattlesnakes off in the corner. And I actually watched one of these big pack rats go and start chewing the rattles off of this snake. And oh. the snake never did anything was just sitting there but there's a lot of interesting things that you you can see if you get out and look for it well you're not out you're under a freaking house yeah <laughs> i just i don't get this. will you go under a house like all year long like even when they're so like in the winter time you could pretty much do whatever with them i wouldn't want to do it but like the odds of being struck during the winter time are pretty low are they not i mean if that rat's chewing its rattles off i mean obviously it's not very active it just depends uh it depends on the house, really, because a lot of people don't realize, but the consistent temperatures that are maintained underneath houses are going to keep them at, you know, 55, 60 degrees underneath right. the house. So it's not like they're under there super, super cold all right. the time. It just kind of depends on the house. But if we get under houses and, you know, it's nice and warm under there, they can still be active. Even, even in yeah. winter. Yeah. Now, okay, is your big not, ass growing, going to, I that's mean. That's what I was thinking, too. They're not little, you should be wiry, <laughs> meth looking. Most guys should be wiry, meth looking dudes that, yeah. you know, that weigh a buck 20. And walk around with a flute and all that <laughs> stuff, right? Right. It's, so, when, I'm going to kind of back up a, a little bit. So, I lived in Abilene. He would come over. We would eat food and do things. And we just, we sat around one night and we decided, we're gonna we're gonna start us up a snake zoo. That's what we're gonna do. And Jesus Christ, I know it's crazy, right? But he had a he had a large collection of snakes. I had a large collection of snakes. So why not just combine them and try to open mm. up another little business type thing? And mm. we planned it for how long did we plan? Just uh, we would we were there every home. pretty much every night till like two or three in the morning. Y'all I mean, are married. Y'all are married, right? I have a girlfriend. <laughs> I am. You're married. Mm -hmm. And your wife thinks this is normal? No. No. Okay, no. good for her. No. <laughs> I'm with her there on this. My girlfriend actually worked in the zoo field, so she worked with animals, so it was a little bit easier. So. What's the rarest shit you... What's the most dangerous snake you got? Right now, mambas, yeah. probably. Oh, what and do you got you? 
Same thing? Well, they're all together now. Oh. They're all together. So you've yeah. got mambas. And that's like, if they bite you, your ass is dead like in a minute and a half, right? Well, not that long. I mean, unless you have a reaction. Um, but yeah. <laughs> I, I would say it's going to take longer than that. Usually people are not going to you know, die that quick. But So you want to play I, with something. If it bites your ass, you're going to die. Sure. Do you have, do you, well, fuck, I can think of a lot of reasons not to. I got five grandkids. <laughs> but it's, but what about, do you have the antivenom there in case a mamba bites you? Mm-mm. Mm-mm. That, that defeats the purpose of playing with it. Jeff. Bullshit on that. Is there? It, it, could if you got bit, if you got bit by the by the mamba, will any of the hospitals have the antivenom for it? Mm-mm. Oh fuck! You're gonna die. <laughs> maybe, right? Maybe. 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 How many times have you been bit by a rattlesnake? Uh, five. Fuck. <laughs> what about you? Probably around the same amount. I mean, so. And I've mm. been bit by two copperheads and a Gila monster too. What so, the Gila monster bite you? Yeah. How big was he? <clears throat> oh, they're about. What the fuck is they're a meaner? Monster. They're meaner and shit. Nah. They're not, it bit your ass. No. I shouldn't have been doing what I was doing. What was you doing? Had a little abscess. I was trying to get out of it. It's mouth. Fuck that. A little, mm. a little abscess. Mm-hmm. That is a nasty looking critter. They're they give you some. Where they bite you in your finger? My thumb. That's the Gila monster. Yep. How how long was you, how how bad did it mess you up? Uh, it was really just the the bite, the pressure of the bite is what really did it. And they they do have teeth, so it went through my, like my thumbnail. Uh, the venom didn't do a whole lot. It kind of swelled my lips up a little bit, and uh, I didn't feel great, but I didn't feel bad or anything. Like it wasn't. I wasn't super concerned. And that's it. A, they're in Arizona, right? Arizona, Utah, yeah. We're in like mm. just under rocks and stuff. So no, like- they they burrow under boulders. You can see right there. Uh, that's actually a pretty good picture. This one. Yeah, you can kind of see uh, where he's the, coming from on the bottom of his jaw right there. That's yeah. where they have there's this modified saliva in there. So that's where all the toxins are. Now, so, is that the sickest that you've gotten from a bite? Is from the Gila monster? Oh no, 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 no. That's nothing. A rattlesnake. The worst I've ever felt was a speckled rattlesnake bite in Yuma County, Arizona. That's the worst one. Did you have to go to the hospital? No. Nah. You don't even go to the fucking hospital? <laughs> no, fuck. What about a Komodo dragon? I know you don't have Have you ever jacked with one of those? I haven't. He might have. have uh, you? I'm not yet. I mean, I, but you'd like to. I would love to, yeah. Uh, they're huge, aren't they? Yeah. Massive. But, uh, massive. But, but they don't kill you with poison. They make you get sick over a gra- and you gradually get sick, right? It's not like instantly. No, so in the beginning, it was thought that it was bacteria in their mouth. Again, this is science uh, that w- what has been found scientifically through. Through scientists, it was thought to be a bacterial um, infection that would take days. But then a uh, pretty famous toxo- uh, toxologist uh, who studies venoms um, from animals ended up finding that they actually have a very primitive venom gland, kind of. And so it is thought now and kind of accepted that it's more of a venomous bite that the animals that they bite, whether it's water buffalo or whatever, will succumb to that. Uh, envenomation several days later, but I mean the lacerations from something that big, from a Komodo dragon, it's it's serious stuff. I mean, they can snap it's, your leg into. Yeah, it, it would cause great damage. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so I think the least uh, amount of your problems would be the, the the venom itself or whatever. It's you know it would be the lacerations that you would have. I mean it's a very large lizard. But you'd like to jack with one of those, right? I mean, it would be like a, be a really cool dream animal. Yeah, it is. Oh, it's thing. the world's largest lizard. It's a yeah. dinosaur. It the is Komodo that. dragon is. Yeah. yeah. Well, they get. Well, they get about three foot long. Oh no, ten no, no. feet. No yeah. shit. Yeah. yeah, they're big. How big should they weigh? Uh, they can weigh. I want to say like two or three hundred. Like two. Yeah. Pounds Jump on them, so. some bitches. That's what look I do. At it's them. I mean, right there. Look at that. Fucking girthy. I mean, look at that lady next to it. I mean, it's the our Son largest. Son of a gun. It's a. I mean, it's pretty much a relative of like the dinosaurs. Are they fast? Also, they can be. I mean, they're not as fast as some other lizards for their size, but they have such a a large stride because they're such a big lizard. They can pick up speed pretty quickly at, at short bursts. There's a video. Um, type uh, type they, in running up there. They Komodo tend to, to Komodo dragon. Give the illusion yeah. that they're slow, but all of a sudden they can take off very very quickly. Mountain lion or Komodo dragon in a room, Andy? Which one are you taking? I'm less. I don't know. I I hate reptiles. Any reptile, lizards, snakes. I don't even like frogs. 
Uh, I I feel like I could get away from a Komodo dragon. I just it, the sight of it would fear me. Like you're not gonna like if if there's I would a, agree if, with you on that. If there's a Komodo dragon between me and the door, I feel like I could probably get around it. You're not getting around a fucking mountain lion. Why don't so, you like frogs? No, I just what don't like frogs, them. Dude? I don't like them. I just I don't like they're slimy. I've got a texture. It's a texture. It's a thing. texture thing. It's a texture thing. I could pick up frogs if I had like gloves, but. I don't know, it's just it's I'm weird with my hands. This for snake fascination just I don't understand it because they're evil to me. I'm scared to death of a freaking snake. I mean, you saw me jump and scream like a little bitch. I'm scared to death of snakes. I can't imagine wanting to go pick one up and grab one. Same as a grizzly bear. Who the hell wants to jack with a grizzly bear either? Oh, well, there's plenty of people. I know, yeah. and I don't I don't you guys I just don't understand. I know a lot of guys love snakes. But the first time you get bit by a rattlesnake, that didn't teach you a lesson. You had to go back and get bit four more times. Yes. So when you so wow. the the time in Arizona, it was Arizona, right? You yeah. got bit. Mm -hmm. What were the symptoms that you had? So it's a really really high canyon. It's a dry fall. So you you park your car down here, and again we're forty fifty miles from the nearest town, if that's what you even want to call that place. It's basically just a border patrol town, is what it is. You're right on the border of Mexico, and you're right on the border of California. And these ranges are about as far southwest as you can get. And they're very, very harsh ranges. Anyway, there's a, there was a canyon, and you hike way up this canyon, and then there's a cave that you go through, and then you have to come down back to the wash. So it's, it's quite a hike. I actually took him and my wife up there. He's afraid of heights, so it wasn't a oh, good time for him. At least you're him. afraid of something. <laughs> and we, I had two other guys with me, and they had already went through the cave and started to descend back down the hill. And... I saw this snake, and these they're white speckled rattlesnakes. They're beautiful snakes, and you probably won't think so, but they are. And I thought, well, i got to catch it. So <laughs> it started crawling into this, what I thought was going to be like a crack in the ground, and it ended up being just like a just a little crevice type thing that I couldn't go anywhere. So when I grabbed it, it grabbed me. And I thought, well, this sucks. <laughs> so I... Uh, put the snake in my bag and started hiking. So I made it back through the cave. And when I say a cave, it's, I mean, it's, it's an old sheep cave or, you know, the way it's, and you can see all sorts of desert sheep scat and everything else through there. So I made it through the cave and the other two guys were about halfway back down. And I said, Hey, I just got bit. And they thought I was joking around. And I said, no, I'm, I'm serious. And not a lot of people know a lot about the venom of that particular region of speckled rattlesnakes. It just hasn't been studied much, and they eat a lot of birds and a lot of lizards there. So generally speaking, when you're eating a variety of prey items, there can be neurotoxins and things like that in the venom. So the first thing that happened, obviously you start to feel weak, and you get a nasty taste in your mouth. You get cotton mouth. It gets really, really difficult to breathe. Then your my peripheral vision started going away, so you'd blink, mm -hmm. and you you could see everything, but it just kind of came in like that. And I, I didn't, I've never fully passed out, but you just it's it's the worst feeling. What'd world. you take? Nothing. Nothing. Drink some water. <laughs> water and I listen for people listening to you. If you get your ass bit by a snake, go to a hospital. Yes, absolutely. I just want to tell that. Yes, because there'll be somebody yes. say, "No, no, I listen to Big Honker. No. This guy got bit a snake and had some water. Honey, get me a Dasani. I'll be okay. <laughs> no, 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 no. Don't, don't." Do what I do at, at, at all. At what point would you ever go to a hospital? You'll go to a morgue. Uh, I think I've been. This, this sounds terrible, but I've been bit so many times that I, I know. If I, I think I would know how serious it was if it was you right. know, a medical. Obviously, they're all medical emergencies, but I feel like I, my body would let me know when. Now, you know, have you had trouble? Have you had any like? Because I've seen pictures like where people got bit and, like they're they're. Like they basically like fillet them open. Yeah, Have that's kind had... of a that's kind of a dated thing now. Too. It is. Yeah, that's okay. a fasciotomy, and and I mean they'll still do it on you because you know they're going to make money off of it. Exactly. But it's from from a lot of the higher toxicologists that do deal with envenomations. They they're totally against it. So because if cause... that mamba bites you, what are you going to do? Drink water? No, no, I'll, I'll go to the hospital. On that. But they can't do nothing for you in Abilene, Texas, for a mamba bite, can they? Is there a generic venom that they can use, antivenom, that works on all snakes? Mm -mm. So basically, you're going to die. I mean, you're going to be really, really fucked up if you don't die. We could probably get some antivenom flown in. It's not the most responsible thing to do, but 
I mean, there are options. How, how do, how do with, they how do they get anti venom? They take the venom from the snake, right? Mm-hmm. What what is it though? So they mix it with different serums. So there's the, the is it Crofab that does it with the sheep? So Crofab uses the sheep. So it's animal based, right? So it's basically comes from some sort of animal. So whether it's a horse or a sheep, they tend to use sheep now because you're less likely to have an allergic reaction to sheep than it is to horse. A lot of people have more reaction uh, to, to horse because it is an animal-based serum. So anything you inject in your body that is an animal product, you can have a reaction, right? Is Anavip horse or is it sheep? I want to say it, one of them's the... Crofab is sheep. Um, I want to say Amavip is horse. So they're mis- mixing the serum with these animal so, products. So what they do is they inject small amounts of venom um, into the animal. Uh, so, of course, they use a horse. And it's and a lot of times they want to use horses because they're large. You can get more blood out of a horse. And so they'll inject small <clears throat> amounts of venom, not enough to kill the animal, but just enough that the body responds to it and produces antibodies. Mm-hmm. Um, then they bleed the horse. And they, in a lab, are able to separate the antibodies, and that is basically how they produce the antivenom that is injected into a person, and then those antibodies essentially bind to the venom and deactivate its its ability to cause damage into the body. Um, but again, they have to monitor to make sure that you don't have an allergic reaction to the horse or the animal that it's derived from. Technically, you can a person can actually get immunity, but there's all sorts of you know, legal logistics of, of using a human for that sort of stuff. But people have, such as Bill Haas and other individuals that actually have build up immunity to snake venoms by giving themselves small doses of that. So yes. you could microdose with anti venom and basically become immune to whatever snake you're going after. Well they use the pure the venom of the snake itself. Right. Um, but in a small dose. dose. Yes. So so in a horse, obviously, you can inject to a more. huge animal. Right. And then they use those antibodies, and that's how they produce the antivenom. And that's injected into you with an IV. It has to go in, you know. And that shit's expensive. They're like $45,000 a vial or something. It because. is in the United States. Of course. <laughs> yeah. And when I say it is, I'm talking about uh, King Cobra antivenom is about 40 to $45 do- uh, a vial. Forty five thousand. The forty five dollars. If you go Taiwan? somewhere, if you're in Taiwan, if you if so, King Cobra. Obviously, they made it in the countries of origin, right? Because you're not going to normally find a King Cobra, right? Um, unless you're, you know, in our place, who we have kings, um, wandering around Abilene, right? So, um, normally these things are native to those countries, so they produce the anti venoms for those snakes in those countries of origin, and so they'll King Cobra anti venom. If I bought it. Um, and shipped it over here would cost $45. Whereas our native stuff that is either produced Crofab here in the States or Amavip, which is produced in Mexico, um, the Crofab is thousands of dollars. I don't know what it is right now, but we're talking about over f- like $5,000 a vial. Watch, watch the resident on Netflix. It shows how they gouge us with all that money for the hospitals. Yeah, it's mm-hmm. insane. So so <laughs> if, if you had a King Cobra, do you have a King Cobra? We have yes, two. We have two. And hopefully Eggs. we're fixing to have... 33 what yeah how do you how do you go from two to 33 babies 31 oh babies babies yeah. mm, i'd hate to be your freaking neighbor i couldn't <laughs> even sleep if i was their neighbor how many um so there are there 33 eggs there's 31 eggs 31 Thir- plus oh, the two okay. adults well, plus <laughs> two so like will they hatch all of them like uh, is it normal for all 31 to hatch probably or, not we're we really that's what we're hoping for but well yeah do their eggs not. do their eggs stick together because there's a guy that I watch on Instagram for some reason. As much as I hate freaking snakes, I'm always waiting to see the bitch get bit. The python guy. Yes, and he's get he he gets the nesting ones out there, and he yeah. just talks, and they try to strike at him. But I know it's not a poisonous snake, but it doesn't look like it'd be fun to be bit by a python either. No. But this king cobra you're jacking with, you don't have. No, I ain't trying to be rude when I say this. When I say good sense, do you not have enough good sense to at least have that vial at your house on the king cobra? It's forty five freaking dollars. So there's a uh, paperwork <laughs> that has to. It's not that simple as just getting it shipped to you. It's classified as an experimental drug by the uh, federal government, and because of that, there is a huge amount of paperwork associated with receiving that antivenom that we have to apply. We have to, has to be, we have to have a 
a secondary doctor that's willing to administer it to us. So it's it can be done. It's just a very large process that has to be done. The last process is being able to demonstrate all that paperwork and show, and then they'll ship the anti the anti venom. They're just not going to ship it to us for forty five dollars. If it were that easy, then we would have already already had it. But so you a, would have someone st on at the house in case, just in case. Yeah, and we are going to go through the process and do it. Um, it's just trying to find a doctor that's willing to do it for us because it's classified as an experimental drug. It's just like anything. It's complicated because it's made to be complicated here, whereas in other countries it's not. Um, so that's what hinders it and makes the process uh, much more complicated. The um, Another question, someone, and someone else is going to think the same thing. What the hell are you going to do with 31 other king cobras? you going to sell them? Mm -hmm. What's the market on a king cobra? We were just talking about that on the way up here. Let, let me guess. Hold on real quick. Okay. I'm going to guess a king cobra, not a baby one that's, I don't even know how big a baby king cobra is. Let's just say a, a year old king cobra. I'm going to bet the market is probably $5,000. What do you think, Andy? I'm going to take the under. I'm going to go thirty two seventy five. Okay, this is the price is right. Okay, Bob Bark. What, what are we looking at? <laughs> Both. So king cobras are very, very reluctant to eat out of the egg. So... They're meaning there's there's a lot of work involved in getting them to feed. Their Latin name Ophiophagus means snake eater. So what we're gonna have to do, we might do it on the way back. Uh, we have to go out and find smaller snakes and like what kind? Uh, ground snakes, flathead snakes, little rat snakes, things like that. They they'll likely only eat smooth scaled snakes. So we're gonna have to go get these, euthanize these other snakes that we've collected, and basically chop them up into little pieces and and get these cobras established that way so you have that tier and one guy has them and the first tier would be assist feeding them so getting a pinky mouse grabbing the snake and forcing it down his throat <laughs> yeah that's the first thing how, uh, big, how big are they whenever they come out of the egg so about what's that 18 inches uh, a little foot? smaller than that probably foot? yeah okay so that's the first thing and one guy has them do you know where that guy's from? is he from florida that guy i don't remember i think he might be and he's he wants for the ones that you have to force feed um He's wanting fifteen hundred for those, and he's wanting the snake. The ones that are eating snakes, those are twenty five hundred, and the ones that are he has feeding on rodents for three grand. And then you have the other guy that is in Florida for sure. Yeah. He has an adult male king, and he was asking six grand for it. So it just kind of depends. how big is that one? Which one? The, the one that the he adult. Has? That one that was uh, eleven feet long. <laughs> Fuck that. Mm. I'm got the heebie-jeebies just sitting. Yo, shit! Y'all have one of these snakes in the truck? Mm. Thank God. Here's the, here's the Komodo dragon running. Yeah. Yep. I mean, he's a fast little bastard, yeah. and he's oh, quick. Yeah. yeah, they can be fast in short bursts. Actually, the native people there that live there, I mean, they've had to live with these animals for, I mean, forever. Obviously, on that island. So what they'll do is they'll actually build their houses up on stilts. So that way, when they're sleeping at night, these lizards can't uh, invade their house. <laughs> where, is, where, where, where is this in Taipan? Where are this at? It's uh, islands off the off of Indonesia. Um, so they're Asian. Um, so they're only found in these small little islands uh, off of Indonesia. So that's where they're native to. I've always like like going to India. India looks when you see it on TV like it doesn't smell very good as a place to be and hot and nasty. And then you see these people working in these fields and they got these fucking cobras and shit running around or they get eaten by a Bengal tiger and stuff. <laughs> I think India is the most populated country in the world now. Yeah, Them is. fucking people have lost their damn mind. Get the fuck out of there. I mean, I'm telling you right now. I don't know what you stick around for. There's nothing about the Indian culture that sounds fun. If you're a woman, they're going to put a damn ju ruby or something on your forehead. You can get ate by a Bengal tiger. Your king cobra is going to get your ass. It smells and it's not air conditioned. Nope, I'm out on that <laughs> shit. <laughs> There's no way in hell I'm doing that crap. And then I see the same thing with the people that's in in Australia. Well, Australia are just crazy. <laughs> there's nothing there that don't kill. There's nothing down there. That's don't what kill I you. tell people. I said there's if you're in Australia, there's it is everything in the water or on land. Um, it is known for having the most venomous animals, the most dangerous and venomous animals on the planet. I mean, it ain't just snakes. I mean, it has great white sharks. It has an octopus that will kill you. It's got a 
the world's most deadliest jellyfish, the box jellyfish. It's got a snail that can kill you. It's called a cone snail. Yeah, there's no way I'm so, going to Australia. So but, I wouldn't be swimming in the water, but uh, I sure would be looking for the snakes there. But in New Zealand, <laughs> but in New Zealand, don't have any of that. This guy's petting his king cobra. Fuck! Oh, screw that. Yeah, I don't know if I would be doing that. Like oh, whoa, was, whoa, whoa, hold uh, on. Was, so you think he's crazy? He was massaging its belly. Yeah, so we we do things. I know that's going to sound very weird, right? Because you think we're crazy, but I mean, we do handle them with tools. There's the black mamba. Um, we handle snakes in a professional fashion more than just yeah. free handling um, venomous snakes. So we, we minimize our, our ability to get bit um, by using tools. Right. Um, there are certain cases where, you know, we've gotten bit. A lot of it, those circumstances were, you know, mine was... You know, trying to help with a removal, you know, things happen. Right? If you're going to be a chef and you're going to, yeah, you know, use a knife, the chances are that you are eventually going to get cut by a knife, right? It's just hazards of the job when you're working with with dangerous animals or anything. Um, it has its risks, um, so we try to minimize that as much as possible. So we don't we don't free handle our snakes. We use snake hooks and tools. And now they're using this. This tube they stick them in, I've noticed. Yep. That's getting to be we the more those, of the thing. Yeah, we use those too. Those are called restraining tubes. It's just a, a plastic clear tube where you can slide the you know the pointy end, the venomous part in the tube, so that way you can restrain the snake. But we normally do that if we're doing a procedure. So if the snake has an abscess or it has a retained eye cap in its eye um, that we need to remove, we can restrain the snake safely. And be able to, you know, use some tweezers and pluck it out. Rather That's than pretty have. normal on the snakes, their eyes, isn't it? Have some yeah, problems? Yeah, so snakes uh, grow by shedding their skin. Um, and even their eye caps are shed. It's called the brill. And so when they go through a shed, um, they actually turn kind of cloudy white and that's mm -hmm. because there's a fluid that's trapped between the old and new skin it's like a lubricant so that way when they shed it comes in out in whole, one whole piece but sometimes it's too dry um or things go wrong and a piece gets stuck and because they have no hands you have to help them mm -hmm. um and when you do that obviously you know you have to put your hands on them so a lot of times we try to avoid that by spraying them really well but sometimes they just can't uh remove the the skin themselves so what would they do in the wild in that situation? Rub up against a log or something? Rub up against a log. Um, so obviously in the wild, there's a, a lot of rocks, a lot of grasses. There's a, just a lot of debris, right? And so what they'll do normally when they're going through a shed, um, they'll clear up. And a week after they clear up, they actually shed. You'll see the snake starting to rub its head mm -hmm. against rocks and logs, some rough surfaces. And then they'll kind of just move around. And the shed, it's kind of like a sock. Mm -hmm. um, if you were removing your sock, an inverted sock, and it just starts to roll down, and they just start to move along, and then they just slide it off their body. But sometimes it breaks. Obviously, it's a fragile. It's just it's just skin. So they'll continue to move around and try to get it off their body. But sometimes they get stuck on them. Now, do you notice at the time when they're shedding their skin, are they more aggressive around that time, just because they can't see as well? Or I don't I don't think aggressive from a behavioral standpoint is ever involved really with a snake um defensive yes uh they, they when they're in that cycle yes they can be a little bit more agitated just because a lot of time is lack of vision type of thing right so they're they're in a vulnerable state and so yeah they're going to be a little bit more defensive i would say but it's not when you deal with as many as we do and uh, as many species as we do they're all they're all different Every, every one of them is different. So, you know, there are the snakes like, you know, our male king cobra. He's he's very grumpy. The the mambas are very flighty, you know, things like that. What they're, does that mean, flighty? Like, uh, just they don't want to be messed with. Like, they'll. They're just spazzes. They, they really are. They're not fun to mess with. But then you go to the rattlesnake stuff. We have a. How big is that diamondback? The western? Yeah. Close, oh, probably close to six, six foot. Eight. And. That's one of the most chill snakes we have in the entire facility. Really? Yeah. It's he's a very very calm snake. Like very you calm. can like it takes a lot to agitate him. Mm, Close I've, that office door, please. Yeah, I've never heard that snake rattle. Have you? No. I've never heard it rattle. It's just like most animals, they have, you know, you have species traits and personalities. Yes. As a species, right? And then you have individual personalities where, you know, that Western Dimeback is just a you know chill snake. And so how they, did you get him? Uh, I caught him in down in uh, was it uh, Willis County down in South Texas. How big was he? 
five and a half foot probably. Yeah. Is he going to talk? I mean, six foot about as big as he'll get. Uh, he should probably get around six and a half, seven, hopefully. Oh, really? That yeah. big? They grow. They're growing big down there. The the further you get south, you know, you get more into that subtropical type habitat. So it very very rarely gets cold enough to put them into a hibernating state. So they they're eating. They're consuming a lot more meals per year. They don't have to worry about the fat reserves in their tail. Mm -hmm. They can just kind of eat. So the more they eat, the more they grow. What would be like the biggest meal like a rattlesnake could could get? Uh, we feed ours rabbits. Ra so it could take mm -hmm. down a rabbit. Anything yeah. past that? Like, does it have to be like over five foot for it to take down a rabbit and eat it and hold it down? Mm. They can they can eat meals that are a lot larger than what you think. I mean, it's. I mean, I, I really don't know, but they, they can eat a, lot, a large meal. The problem is after they eat that large meal how vulnerable they are if you eat right you know if a rattlesnake eats a baby goat it's going to be very vulnerable for a long time because it, you know it's not going to be able to move like it normally would it's not going to be able to curl up and do its normal thing so i think they kind of they have an idea of the appropriate size prey item to, to to try to take but a cottontail rabbit for a five foot rattlesnake's a meal oh yeah that's not a problem yeah. at all how long can he take takes for him to digest that break it down a couple weeks probably so he's not going to eat again for a while. Yeah, usually the big, the bigger rattlesnakes, and again, it, it, it's all species dependent. So we have indigo snakes and the cobras and the mambas. They have a super fast metabolism, meaning we have to feed them more often. A lot of the king snakes have a faster metabolism. Uh, baby snakes, like we feed them more often. But a big adult rattlesnake like that, or a gaboon viper, or something, or or big python, it's basically about once a month. That that big ass rattlesnake is vulnerable from an indigo snake, right? Uh, that, don't indigo the indigo snakes would have a very very hard time eating that snake. They don't eat rattles, but they eat rattlesnakes. They right? eat a lot of rattlesnakes, but yes. they eat smaller ones. Then yeah, it's it's again it's like <clears throat> it's a four foot indigo snake is not going to try to take down a four foot rattlesnake. So it's looking for a foot, a one foot, eighteen inch long snake, a foot and a half. They so the big indigos, and there are some videos of them. Uh, they they can eat a large snake. Not as large as our king cobra, obviously, but they can eat very large snakes. But not, it'd be like, you know, us trying to eat a burrito as big as this goose. You know, it's, we can only eat so much. So then I think they know that. Are they real fast indigo snakes? Faster than you'd think. How fast is fast? Uh, probably 8.7 miles per hour. So they're, they're going to, a fat fucker like me is going to have trans, get trouble getting away from one of them. Uh, it'll get away from you. So that's what he does. He just comes up behind it and snatches it. That's not an indigo snake. That's not an indigo snake? Mm -hmm. Fucking TikTok. What is it? It's a cobra. Eating that was a, a cobra? Yeah, it's eating a Burmese python. Well, son of a bitch. That's why you can't trust anything <laughs> can't on the trust internet. trust the internet. <laughs> Cannot trust the internet. But in, we have indigo snakes here, right? Not here, here. No. They're, they're too cold here? Yeah. They start Are around... Are any of these an indigo snake? This one's got a rattlesnake. Is that an indigo snake? Yeah, that is. They're, no, but in South Texas, they have them, right? Yeah. The closest I think you can get them here is going to be around Brackettville. And then if you go kind of from there back to the east, kind of around Uvalde. So the south of San Antonio area, you can start getting into them. So the valley of Texas will have them. Yeah. Okay. All, the Rio Grande Valley is, is full of them. Is there a lot of rattlesnakes there? Yes. So we had a guy that's a big poacher. and I mean, that's his prince of poachers, Charles Bay. We did, a, we did some podcasts with him. And he stayed on the King Ranch for all these years poaching deer and i asked him how many i said but you ran in a lot of rattlesnakes he said never ever seen one ever down there and that shocked me because you know they're mm -hmm. everywhere down there they really are and but i wonder if that's because you know you're in that thorn scrub stuff right there so if you think about how concealed and camouflaged those snakes would be there i mean i've, I've never hunted a whole lot around kingsville but most of my stuff's further south but yeah you can drive around like county roads and stuff down there and yeah there's rattlesnakes all over that's what i would think so too we used to have a lot of rattlesnakes here we don't have as many rattlesnakes here now as we used to because and back in the day as soon as we'd have our first like in october when it start getting cold the mm -hmm. first time and the, the the pavement would be warm you could drive down these roads and you'd see rattlesnakes everywhere yeah. i don't see rattlesnakes like we used to i know we still have them here i think i remember this video <clears throat> the guy was he was at like a gate yeah and then it just fucking got him so here's a king snake that's in Arizona or California. I didn't see what the rattlesnake was. It looked like a Southern Pacific or okay, Northern so Pacific. Be in Cal California there. And how the hell do y'all know that that fast? 
Just off of its markings? Yeah. Yep. Do you know what ducks are from way off? Well, I guess the so. Same thing. Okay. When you uh you did a video here the other day. You did a you you came to Knox County just mm-hmm. recently. Yes. You were north of town, right? Yes. Do you know where they were at, Andy? No. Tid <clears throat> I don't know if I can say that on the air, but Tidwell is she lives in Breckenridge or Albany. It's uh what uh, I can find the video. What was it? It was just on your Facebook page. Yeah, I just yeah. saw somebody say it was north of Knox City. Yeah, it wasn't very far. I want to say like maybe like two or three miles, something like that. Did you take a ride on the feedlot road? Had to be somewhere between Sandy Lane and Dad's old house. It was Sandy out there. That uh, there's a bunch of them. What is it under? Big Country Snake Removal or something yes. else? Yeah, I'm just trying to figure out how close these are to any of the stuff we have. <clears throat> Did you get a lot of snakes? I want to say seventeen. Any big That's rattles? No. Nothing, nothing big? Nothing huge, no. In an old house? Yeah, it was an old house. They're actually going to tear it down. The The house, it's a pyramid beam house, but it didn't have any skirting along the outside. So she said that one of the guy, one of her ranch hands comes from New Mexico and helps her out once a month. And she sent me pictures of the house, and she said that the guy saw two big rattlesnakes going there. But you, you can never trust what, some, what somebody says no, when they I, say a big rattlesnake. So... Um, and they were out basking on this concrete porch. And I said, well, they're underneath that porch. And she said, well, it's all cracked and everything. And I said, well, we probably need to get underneath that porch. And, and they're tearing down the house and rebuilding there. So it wasn't a big deal. The guy had a skid steer, and he just basically lifted up the broken concrete. And there they were. Oh, yeah, here it is. So he just pulled that up? Yeah. And then that's where they were? Yeah. Well, uh, just kind of all, they were all kind of scattered throughout. Ish. <clears throat> that is not a good situation. I found a really, really cool old shotgun shell under there too. Really? Like a the, with the paper shell. Oh, that is an old shotgun shell, then. Yeah, here it is. Check that out. Oh yeah, super. It's, win- it's a Winchester. Super X. Yep, that's pretty neat. I got a box of those right over there. Of the paper ones. Mm-hmm. Not very uh, water resistant. There they are, those oh, little bastards. And then what do you do with and, and this is this where Tony comes in? Like you're handing them to Tony or how's this how's this operation work? No, so that was by myself on that one. Oh. Um where are they going? You're just letting them go? No, I ain't letting them go. Huh? Oh. <laughs> I'm gonna get them. And just put them in that box? Yeah. So what what what's her what are your what's your charge for coming to do this to somebody's house? I think that was three fifty, somewhere in there. Oh, that's, that's money well spent. Fuck yeah, especially if you don't like snakes. Mm, I, I, it's well, well spent. I'll tell you a story. We were in Oklahoma where we used to hunt at, and um, Game Warden was telling me the story. There's a certain mountain there. We'll call it Lookout Mountain. I mm-hmm. can't remember the name of the place. Got to call it Lookout Mountain that a guy had been rattlesnake bit. He drives up there, and ambulance is on his way, and there's this old meth head looking guy there. And he's like, what are you doing? Oh, I got bit by a snake. He said, well, where were you? Because that mountain's trespassing. Oh, I was just right here in the ditch. Mm-hmm. What were you doing in the ditch? Well, I was just walking around here, and I saw a snake and reached down to, to, to get it. He said, eh, it just didn't seem so right. So the guy got to the hospital, and he wasn't swelling up or nothing. He said, they was in the hospital. He said, tell me where exactly where you're at. So he finally guy broke down. Okay, okay, I was trespassing. I was on Lookout Mountain, and my bucket's up there, and there's a snake in it, and my my handles up there my snake catcher so he went up there and got the snake and he'll let the snake go or do whatever the hell he did the snake about a week later got a call snake bite at lookout mountain goes back there same son of bitches there again he goes i thought i told you not to be in there trespassing you're gonna get trespassed for ticket ticket for trespassing now he goes what did you do he said well, i had it on my put it in my bucket and it bit me he goes well, what are you doing the guy would reach down and grab the snake and then would let go of it and try to grab it with his hand before he let go of the deal. And some bitch bit him twice in the same spot. Second time wasn't a dry strike. It was a good strike. That, does, just, that doesn't sound... That's stupid. Yeah, well, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Told him. Just it. But got bit by a rattlesnake twice in the same hand in a week. And luckily, the first one was a dry bite. But would have the deal down, but let go of it, then go to grab it. Wow. Huh. <laughs> wow. Not very smart, I guess. No, he was not. But, got, but same place twice. He said, I couldn't believe it. There, another ambulance yeah. call, same spot for a rattlesnake bite. Pulled up as the same guy. I thought, there is no way in hell. Yeah. So, nice. like, this house, what makes it a den? Do, do, like, two or three snakes go off there, and then they have babies, and then that's where they all just start going? Or is there some communication system to where, like, hey, Jim and Tammy, like, come here for the winter. This is It's a great place. <laughs> Nobody's here. It's, it's Yes, it's, it's a more complicated than that. Yeah? It's... A lot of these, a lot of these dens are 
somewhat of a family circle in there. Mm-hmm. So what causes a den to be a den is a den is always going to be in a place where the air is stagnant, relatively stagnant, because that's going to create more of a consistent temperature year round. So all, all you know, underneath houses, obviously there's not a whole lot of airflow going under there. Right. Porches like that, there's no airflow. Or if you're out hiking around, you're going to focus on kind of the south facing slopes where there's crevices and caves. And that's where you're going to find them where there's just not a lot of airflow in there. And the way that snakes move, you know, they're, they can sense other snakes. They can, there's a lot of ways that they can move around through their habitat. And if they find these places, if you can find a den, that is pretty much a guarantee. That's the absolute best spot for them to survive a winter. So they can be down in cellars. Actually, on that job with them. Yeah, that's what I'm looking at. Part, four. part two, you're like down in a cellar. Yeah. <clears throat> there were three or four down there, something like that. You don't have a light either. I'm not seeing a flashlight. Uh, I have one. You do? Yeah. Because, like, I would be worried about the one that I don't see that's like, or is that where you check first? Like, as you're coming down the steps. There was one there. You just step over it? No, No, you get him first? Looked at it, yeah. Uh, Because I hate going in my cellar. I caught, there was a garter snake in there. I'm, I, I'm, That's I'd a rather, damn rattle cobra. I'd, rather, thing. I'd <laughs> rather dick with the tornado and not have to go down there. At least there wasn't a frog. Exactly. <laughs> well, I, I, you know, the, the garter snake didn't make it. Speak. Just change subject. Have y'all seen the video going of the guy sitting and he was on a conference call and the fucking squirrel was in his office? Uh. Uh-uh. Oh Jesus Christ! I wish I could. It was on TikTok or some shit. And this guy's in an office and a squirrel. He's talking to somebody and you hear him go, huh? <laughs> I haven't seen he, it, no. And he's looking around, and he grabs a bat. I guess he thought the fucking baseball game was going to break out in his office. <laughs> Anyways, this fucking squirrel comes jumping like he goes across his desk, and he sounds like he's getting fucking murdered. You know this guy on the Zoom call is like, what the fuck is going on? Somebody's <laughs> killing this guy. And I haven't seen it. He's fighting this fucking squirrel. I scared the shit out of him. With a squirrel? Yep. I'll try to find it. I'm going to circle back to something you said earlier. You, you were saying, you know, Used to y'all see a lot of rattlesnakes on the dirt roads mm-hmm. and stuff, and you're not seeing them as much. Um, there's there's a reason for that, and the reason is several years ago when we had that really bad freeze, mm-hmm. that didn't help anything. A lot of a lot of snakes died during that freeze, even under houses. We were I can't remember where we were. We didn't see them before that the big freeze though, like we used to. We haven't seen snakes in 20 years like we used to. Really, Mm-mm. but right now some of the stuff that I'm doing. So just to give you an example, it, so it's. It's based off of the freeze, and we would go under houses. We found 30-something dead rattlesnakes under the house that were basically frozen. So a lot of those snakes just didn't make it. Um, but to give you an example, we from the freeze, we, we've been forced with this terrible drought, and that's mm-hmm. very, very complicated for a snake. They don't really know what to do. Do they, do they hunker down and hope that something happens, hoping a prey item comes by, or do they venture off looking for food and burn more calories? They're just forced with a really hard decision, and... I started noticing a few years ago, a lot of the snakes that we, I would see in certain areas were very, very emaciated and skinny. And they were the ones that were out forced. To, it was life or death at that point. Most of them, once they get to that stage, are dead anyway. But just to give you an example, so there's a, I monitor rattlesnake dens all over this region. And there's a cellar in Baird that I can usually average around 30 snakes in there. This year, there's 11, this winter, there was 11 in there. So they're down roughly two thirds for that localized population right there. Mm-hmm. So, and it, it, again, it's the it's from the drought and then the the freeze. That what about really the wild hogs? Is that a is that a just a tail or is the wild hogs that detrimental to them? It's horse crap. It so is. So they don't yeah. they don't really kill that many of them. Then. No, I'm, a hog will eat anything. Y'all know that. Right. But they've they've done a lot of studies on that. There was uh, they killed when they do those helicopter uh, flower whatever flowers or whatever they call those. And they shoot all these hogs. Some people, you know, they actually want to get some evidence of what's what's actually going on. So they'll take like some of the stomach samples. And the one that they did in Coleman County a few years ago, I think they killed 80 hogs out of, of a wheat field. And none of those had any traces of any sort of reptile in them at all. What Have you seen? The, uh, we've got a buddy of ours, Heath, the local kid here, that had a film of a badger carrying a big rattlesnake in its yeah. mouth. Yeah. One of the coolest things I've ever seen. Yeah. And I'm assuming badgers do not get bit by the, the venom. Doesn't bother a badger? Not. I mean, it, it probably can, but not to the degree that it's going to mess with other animals. So, because I'm sure a snake's crawled in a badger hole by accident before. I actually, uh, I know where several rattlesnake dens are that are abandoned badger holes. Oh, really? Yeah. There's just too many of them for the badger to take, and they're like, "Oh fuck it, I'll go dig another hole." I th- well, I think the thing with badgers is they they kind of 
they move around a lot. Oh. So they, if you can find one badger hole, if you, you know, if you look around that, that same area, you're going to find five or six other badger holes. So they're, 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 they're digging a lot of holes. So and, the den and baird, you go in, you, you've taken out 30 snakes this year. You said there was 11. That is, so that's predominantly going to be a rattlesnake den? I don't, even I don't though, take any of them out. Oh, you don't? No, this is just for me to look. Oh, just to observe. Yes. Oh, okay. yeah. Well, I'd find me a better hobby. So you've is. lost. So there's 20 Oof. snakes that are gone just from that. Mm-hmm. Wow. And no, this is on a, a almost an abandoned type of ranch. Nobody, there's there's no cattle. There's no nothing going on on this ranch. Um, it's no, a bad year to be a snake. Yeah. The, bad, the last few years have been... Very bad. What what would a snake live to be in the wild? Is there any is there any documents of five it, years old, six years old? Oh, most are older than that. Oh, really? Yeah, I'd say 30, 40, 50 Probably it's a reptile. I don't think that long, just because they're they deal with too many too many obstacles. But in captivity, I mean, he has a snake at our our serpentarium that he had since he was a little kid. So I was ten years old. So what kind of snake is it? It's a ball python. But how old is that? I guess. Man, thirty. Yeah, like how 30 big years is it? old? Bull pythons are a small species of of uh, python, so I would say probably about maybe uh, from head to tail, maybe about that much. It's a male too, so it's going to be smaller. So, did you you um, ever see them guys in New York at Battery Park? Those black guys that got those big ass pythons that get people to take pictures with them. Yeah, that was I remember that. I mean, Coney Island would do that a lot too. When you go on the board on the like the boardwalk and yeah, they were calling people off the ferries. You know, come over and get your picture, man. Fuck that shit. When over the way, it's got I, they're scared. How, and the suckers, some of them are 10, 12 foot long. Depends on the species. So, I mean, if we're t- dealing with like the longest species of snake in the world, um, which we have one, it's a reticulated python. Is that the white one, yellow one? Uh, no, this one's patterns. I mean, they have a reticulated pattern on there from Asia. Um, babies would get eaten by king cobras. Obviously, one this size would not, but. That is the longest uh, snake. I'm try- How long is ours, though? Ours is probably 18, I mean, 17, oh, 18 feet. Hell no. But they can get, you know, over 20 feet. That'll long. eat a person. At that point, I would say it's very rare, right? So <laughs> not to sound messed up, but, you know, you know, if you're dealing with, especially where some of these species, a lot of them are either uh, Asian or, or African species or South America. So a lot of the natives there are rather small, obviously. So it has happened. It's extremely rare. Usually they can't get over our wide shoulders. Um, Thank but, God. But, you know, it's it's pretty rare. Um, anacondas are the heaviest snake in the world. And there's been a couple of fatalities um, in South America. But they're very rare. It's not a problem, as, you know, you would think um, when it comes to what? living in Asia and South America. There's other issues, other animals that are a lot more... Uh, account for for injuries and deaths and just just livestock alone will easily surpass anything that a snake will do what about like uh you're seeing them they're, they're taking over the everglades the pythons mm-hmm. yes. and- so that's a burmese python that's another of the large species of constrictors and that's an unfortunate situation of obviously we don't know exactly what happened but there's several there's several theories obviously people releasing their pets there was also a very bad hurricane that um destroyed a facility that basically allowed all those pythons to escape in that localized area mm-hmm. um and obviously that population florida is perfect unfortunately for especially the everglades for a lot of things to survive that had the the environment you know there's a lot of introduced species not just uh, the burmese pythons i mean there's parrots there's monkeys there's caiman um so that's just a unfortunate situation so there's monkeys in the everglades now there's in florida there are populations of uh of monkeys there's caiman lots of exotic fish that are not native um and then obviously the famous burmese pythons that were introduced there but because florida and the everglades is such a you know a stable environment that a lot of these species could definitely um, acclimate to that but in other parts of the country that's not a concern. Like if a Burmese python got out in, in Texas, it would it would die. There's no question. Even in South about Texas, it, it would. Sir, it's too dry. It's way too dry. Um, they need that humidity. Um, and what again, about I, Southern Louisiana? Maybe that might be something. I mean, it hasn't, as far as I'm aware of, hasn't. You know, I haven't heard of any accounts of that. But um, I think what ended up happening, what really made the situation worse, was. You know, having one loose snake is one thing. Mm-hmm. The chances of encountering another male or female to breed, I think it was just 
you know, all at once when they had that storm, that localized uh, situation that they had there probably didn't didn't help. But. And well, they're they are, eating gators too, aren't they? The pythons are eating gators in the Everglades? There's been a, yeah, there's been a couple of accounts of that. Um, and obviously eating um, native mammals that are there. Um, so they, they caught like one that was 18 or 20 foot. If they, I'm right. So they have hunts there to control them. Um, every, I don't know if it's every year or what it is, but they have uh, fish and wildlife there has uh, hunts where they just, people go out and um, obviously hunt as much as many of the uh, Burmese pythons as they can, because they're not native. We had uh, the Python Cowboy on the podcast a couple of years ago, and he's contracted by the Florida he, Fishing Game, and he all saved, he does. He saved two gators from pythons. Really? Jumped in the water with them and, like, I don't know, separated them somehow. This one's got a gator in it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it does. But I don't... And that's a big gator. Yeah, they can... They big can, ass snake. I mean, they can eat things three to four times the size of their head. When you deal with a constrictor like large... Obviously, can eat bigger things. Screw that! Now, God what, Almighty. what do they do? Like, whenever they've got a gator in their belly, do they? Will they like den up somewhere and try to digest this big ass meal? So, what they'll probably do, like he, like Nathan said earlier, um, when they swallow <clears throat> large prey like that, they're kind of, as you can see right now, it's it's got a big girth. Yeah, um, it'll restrict the snake's movements. So they'll normally find the good place to tuck in, probably you know, in the grasses and the Everglades under plants, and they'll curl up there and kind of just wait it out. Uh, digest their prey. Something that big would probably take several weeks for them to yeah. digest. And then once they uh, can move, <laughs> they'll start moving around. Then they'll move around to different locations and stuff like that and you know, try to hunt something else. But that meal alone, something that big would last him uh, a very long time. What so, would you rather have, Andy? That gator or that python? Hmm. It'd be a tough choice. I think I'd go with the damn snake. I don't know. You man. don't like alligators either? Nothing. I don't want nothing to eat my Nothing ass. with scales. I mean, if he was, didn't have no teeth on him, he wouldn't bother me. There was a video I saw. A guy had a big python, and it bit him in the face. And, you know, they've got those curved teeth. Mm-hmm. He could not. He couldn't get it. He couldn't get both jaws off of his face because it kind of curled here and it curled mm-hmm. here. So it was kind of like a no-win situation. Just kind of had to. So, so snakes have no, obviously, no legs. So one of their ways they eat is they have those recurved teeth. And... Obviously, it helps to grab onto something. It's like a fish hook, right? Mm-hmm. And but also, it helps act like a fork. So when they swallow things, and if you look at video of snakes eating, you can see that that what they do is you know they'll use their top jaw, <clears throat> push down their bottom, so they're kind of forking in their food in their mouth because they have no limbs. Right. So I mean, it's designed to hold on to prey because they obviously have no limbs, but they also use their teeth to help kind of fork down their food as they're swallowing it. So do, do you, it's recurved for, for that reason. So if you ever get bit, you know, yeah, it's like a fish hook. You're not going to rip it out. You have to right. kind of like push in and out, you know, kind of mm. try to get it that way. So do you have children? One. How old? Seven months. You can let it be around a python? I mean, not when he's... Seven have you, years old. Have you, seen, <laughs> have right you seen the videos? These people, it's got these little kids, two and three years old, playing these freaking snakes. No, that's that's not going to happen. It's no. stupid. Yeah, it's very stupid. I, I, I'm glad you said that because yeah. I didn't know how a snake person would be, but I don't understand that. I mean, it'd be like the Tiger King putting something in with the damn tiger in a yeah, cage. It just doesn't make sense. That's senseless. It's, and that's the thing that we have... Have Tony and I have been bit both more than most people we have together? But we've done some stupid things, but... As we get older and grow up, I guess, we, we've we gotten a lot more responsible with right. everything we do. And, you know, like we said about the Serpentarium stuff, I don't know how many snakes we have in there, 250 or something? <laughs> and a lot, 90% of them are venomous snakes, so from all over the world. But we're everything's very calculated. We use tools. We're very professional. We don't do stupid things. And... Are you milking your snakes? No, it's not necessary. So it's just to yeah. just to have them. That's like this is going to be kind of like a segue into the Sweetwater Rattlesnake Roundup. You know, do you like being lied to? No. Do you? Not particularly. Okay. So could you imagine paying somebody money and to have them lie to you? Because that's what the Sweetwater Rattlesnake Roundup is. How do they lie to people? So they say that they use they, they're doing all this milking for anti venom. That's not true at all. Really? What Not are they sure. doing? They're just catching rattlesnakes. Exactly. Yeah. It's it's just a mo- it's a money thing over there. You know, yeah. they say that they're educating the public when they're not educating the public. I have I have Tony and I are actually going to kind of sit down and do a video on this stuff too. There's 
luckily there's a lot of YouTube videos out there of these guys saying certain things that are that are 100% false. So, you know, one guy's saying use a Sawyer venom extraction kit. That's, you don't do that. Um, there's a guy walking around a pit of rattlesnakes, and they have, for whatever reason, they have a Great Plains rat snake in there, and they're calling it a bull snake. So just things like that. How are you educating people when – what you're saying is wrong. But it's supposed to make money. And if they just come out and said, listen, if you'll bring all your rattlesnakes here, we'll buy them, we're going to sell them, and then they'll be death and you won't have snakes no more. A lot of people like me be like, hey, that's pretty damn good. Yeah. Let's get rid of mosquitoes too. Well, here's the, here's the, it gets, it's, it's, it's like, so there's so many layers to this. So the one that really bothers me the most is they say population control. We do it because we're controlling a population of snakes. And, that's, that's a lack of fundamental understanding of what ecology is and how it actually works. That's, that's not how it works. Mother Nature, there's a carrying capacity to any sort of wildlife. Um, I mean, we're in a pretty rural area out here, so I'm trying to think of some sort of analogy here. A lot of ranchers around here, there's a lot of cattle around here. If you have 100 acres, you can't put 50 cows on there and expect them to do Right. Well, for very long, it's, that's a carrying capacity. You have to take away to to survive. Yes. So, and that's that's just kind of a bland example of what I'm talking about. But there's there's layers to it. So, the numbers have gone down as as far as rattlesnakes go, due to obviously weather and everything else. But going in there and they're using gasoline to pump into these dens to push them out. You know what? You would get ticketed if you changed oil and went and just dumped it on the ground. You know, it's, right. it just doesn't make sense in, in that sense. But as far as population control, you can't do that. It, it doesn't work that way. So what happens is, and this is a theory that I'm trying to work on. It's going to take a lot of years, but compensatory reproduction. It's one of the things is the more you take out of the environment that's supposed to be here. And again, the pythons and all that stuff, that's completely different. Those are invasive. And the wild hogs, the same thing. But... If you, if you consistently take snakes out of this particular ecosystem, what's going to happen is Mother Nature is going to say, whoa, 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 we got we to gotta do something here. And I've seen evidence of it, and I'm, again, I'm still working on it, but now the snakes are breeding twice a year, and the litter sizes are going up significantly. We're on an average female right now. Is usually, uh, they can breed twice a year, but an average female is only going to breed once a year, and she's going to have roughly 12 babies. We've gotten some at our Serpentarium that were gravid, and we wanted to see how many babies they had. And then the litter sizes are going up. So the the first one that really triggered all this thought process was up in Spur, and they'd been killing rattlesnakes, 10 or 12 rattlesnakes a year for the last 15 years. We got into the house, removed around 30 of them, and I want to say it was 60% of the adult females under there had babies in the wintertime. So we kept two of those, I believe. We kept two of them. One of them had 18 babies, which is above average, and the other one had 22. Whew. So what I'm saying is, like, it, on the surface, yeah, the rattlesnake roundup, let's go gather up all these snakes and let's go sell them. Let's do that. That's great. Hindsight is you're actually creating a bigger problem by doing it that way. Right. right, because Mother Nature will take over at some point. Absolutely. And they're, like you said, litter sizes will get bigger and they'll breed more frequently. Yes. Right. What are you doing with your snakes that you get, like the ones in Knox County? You said, okay, I'm you 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 didn't just let them go. What do you what you do with them? I relocate. That's yeah. absolutely crazy. Yeah, <laughs> we we take some of the some of the bigger. I knew you snakes. were going to tell me that. <laughs> we take some of the the bigger snakes and we'll euthanize them and freeze them and we'll feed them to our male king cobra. Some of the bigger snakes because he's he's a giant. So we do that with some, but most of them get relocated, and it's not like. You know, I'm not driving them down some county road and just dumping them in a ditch. I'm, we appreciate that around here. Yes, yeah. I, I promise you I'm not doing that. I, I actually care about these animals, and I want to give them the best chance of survival uh, that I can. And so most of them, you know, they're going to go into known den sites, and that's another thing, too, that a lot of people think I do. So, okay, I, I just caught, you know, 88 rattlesnakes. I'm going to go dump them into one den. It doesn't work like that. That would be the opposite of what I just talked about. Right. So – the survivability of those snakes is next to nothing if I dumped them into that. So I'll have dens, and uh, I, mean, I can show you on my phone how many dens that are in this area that most people probably don't even know about. Don't want to know about either. Yeah. <laughs> it's, 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 it's a lot more complicated than, than what I it seems on the surface. I respect you for doing what you do. I'm a, I'm a waterfowl hunter, and I love ducks and geese, mm -hmm. and I want to see them thrive. Yeah. You're the same with your snakes, and I appreciate that. Snakes just scare the shit out of me. Yeah, and they but do I, a lot of people, but uh, it's one of those things like – how many snakes have you been around other than the hog nose? Not many. Not as many. I'm very none if it's up to me. I mean, yeah. I have. I mean, I've seen 
I mean, we kill a couple of rattlesnakes out here every year. I know you don't want to hear that, but if I see a rattlesnake out here, I'm going to kill it. Well, that's that's another thing that yes, Tony and I are very passionate and borderline obsessed, I guess, with with snakes, and we we care for them and all this. But you definitely have the right, and I respect your right to protect what you feel necessary. Yeah, I don't want to bite so, a dog or a kid exactly, or a yeah, exactly. Well, we got to worry about them as in October is our worst time out here because right. we'll they're going to den. We'll have fifty or sixty people out here. A lot of kids, and you know they run around. The dining halls in here, social rooms across the way. So, I would hate to know that uh, an eight-year-old kid was just walking Absolutely. to go to the social room from dinner, and a rattlesnake got. And we him, keep so. things clean and, and yeah, mowed, we keep everything and everything, and, cl- and it's clean. We don't have a lot of junk nowhere, but this still is a <clears> sandy <throat> area by the river. Mm-hmm. We well, used to have in the lot, country in Texas. Yeah, we used to have a lot of rattlesnakes here. Yeah. A lot. There's a couple of dens at the old house that was here. I mean, we had a lot of snakes here, and we just don't see them, but. Right south of here, there's a county road that I used to see a bunch of big rattlesnakes on. There's an old house there. Yeah. I haven't seen a rattlesnake there in three or four years. Really? But but I'd noticed a long time ago we see less rattlesnakes than we used to. Like on the road back 25 years ago, if I was driving down the road out here at nighttime, you were going to see a rattlesnake every night somewhere. I'd tell yeah. people that. And if I saw a snake, oh, there's a rattlesnake. Mm-hmm. Very sell- Now I see more king snakes than I do rattlesnakes. Really? Or not king snakes, bull snakes. Bull snakes. Okay. I see a lot more bull snakes. I don't even know what a king snake is. I see a lot more bull snakes now than I ever do. And these hog nose snakes, I've seen three or four of them in the last couple of years. I'd never seen one up until a couple of years ago. They, they've always been here. Um, there still are rattlesnakes here. You, you know that. Yes. Uh, the eastern hog nose snakes, that's what that was. There's also the plains hog nose snake. Kind of when you get back towards Abilene a little bit, they start to show up there. Um, there you're always going to find those eastern hog nose in a sandy area because they eat toads. And that's what the... The toads are always going to be in the same. Speaking of toads, let's talk horn of horn frogs now. Horn horny frogs. toads. Horny toads. Boner horn toads. Frogs. Horny toads. I seen one a couple years ago here. Mm-hmm. I, when I was a kid, that was a pretty common animal. Yeah, they're they're very protected, right? Do you see them very much? Are they are they making any kind of comeback? Or are they struggling? So I do a lot. Tony and I as well. Uh, we we have a county road behind our, where our snake facility is, and we drive up and down it all the time. I did a video. A year or two ago, where I approached 50 rattlesnakes and I tried to get one to chase me because, you know, snakes apparently chase people. <laughs> I don't know what I'm doing wrong, but I've never been chased by a snake. Um, and I've seen a few out there uh, on the warmer days. I've seen some, but if you go like, do you know where Barnhart is or Mertzen or mm-hmm. down in Erion County, south of San Angelo? There's a road down there. And I mean, there's hundreds of them. They're everywhere you go. So the further you get kind of, Southwest towards the Trans Pecos region, there there's a lot of. When them. I was a kid, I grew up in Wichita Falls. They were very common. Yeah, like at our school, our elementary school, you'd see them there a lot of times. But there, I've got a grown, I've got a buddy of mine, grown man. He's sixty years old. He don't believe they're real because he's never seen one in his life. Really, but you know, we don't have arm- armadillos here no more like we used to either. That's weird. Too. It's it's one of those things like I tell people, and when it comes to to wildlife, just like anything. Whether you're dealing with, you know, with ducks or anything, it's people tend to think that these animals are an unlimited resource where we can hunt them and hunt them and hunt them and there's no consequences to the population. So it's one of those things is it's very important and that's, you know, just like any good hunter, right? You want to make sure that you have Mm -hmm. what you want to hunt in the future, right? So this is why we have certain rules and certain things like, you know, a quota or we have, you know, don't collect the males or the females. And that goes with anything. I mean, some of the most basic life forms that we eat, like crab, you know, have a quota. You don't collect this or that. That's so that way we, we ensure that for the future generations, we have what we want as we grow. I mean, this planet is you know we're, we're we're taking over there's there's a lot more land that we're using going back to your horn lizard what was common 40 years ago 30 years ago may not necessarily be common now because of the growth and expansion horn lizards are very specific on what they eat so um they actually they're type of lizard actually and so they feed specifically on harvester ants about 80 percent of what they consume is they have to eat 
uh, harvester ants. Those are those those big, big red, red ants. ants oh, that you okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So if you don't have those around, you're not going to have. I don't see red ants much anymore. Either. Well, there's there's your source. Yeah. So if you don't have the food source or what the animals need, right? It goes back to the basics of any animal. If I'm wanting to, you know, to hunt a duck or something, I'm gonna look for a body of water, right? right. So if I'm going to look for horn lizards, I'm going to look for the essentials for that animal's survival, and that is, you know, a, more of a you know desert grassy area. With, with harvester ants. If I'm going to an area and there's no harvester ants because people don't want to get stung and they eliminate the harvester ants, we just eliminated their food source. Then they starve to death. That's why we had them on our elementary right. school playground because we had shitloads of red and, ants. Yes. Mm-hmm. And then obviously we eliminate that, right? Because we don't want that around. We just eliminate the horn lizard, which would explain why in more rural areas, when we head west, they're a lot more common. Because who the, who's going to give a crap about, you know, a harvester ant colony in the middle of nowhere, right? So they're going to be a lot more common. They're not the quickest creatures either. So any sort of habitat destruction or fragmentation of that occurs, they're not a species that's very good to adapt, you know. Uh, but the main problem would be your source of food um, with pesticides killing those harvester ants. They depend uh, on those those harvester ants to survive. That's, just, that makes lots of sense. But we it was something you used to see pretty common, and you don't see them. Yeah. Which, if, with today's farming practices, we've wiped out a lot of areas that that you know were sufficient for a lot of reptiles that we don't yeah. have anymore. Yep. So. And that's why you'll still see them around in areas where it's you know pretty much untouched. There's still populations there, and they're doing very well. But once we start, you know, building things and malls and things like that, and eliminate their ants. Um, they're done. I mean, they're not very mobile lizards. They don't. They don't even climb well. <laughs> they're, they're kind of restricted to the ground. So um, they're very sensitive to that sort of sort sort of change. Will we will we eventually get iguanas up here because they are not green iguanas? It's way too dry out here. Way too dry. But what about on the Texas coast, like around South Padre and stuff? Because they're all over Mexico. Well, they're they're actually. I mean, you can get several different species of uh, iguana, invasive iguanas down, and I mean. In the, Porter. Uh, in the valley of Texas, starting the, to have them? Deep, the heart of it. like deep, Not the heart of it, the the bottom end of it, the Cameron County. Yes, Willis around, County, South Padre down yeah, there. All they're starting stuff. to have iguanas now. Mm-hmm. It's where, yeah. they're, where the habitat would be you know, sufficient for them to, to survive. Because they're all over Florida now. Oh, yeah. Or, they're in the Everglades. You know, it's crazy. When we were in Puerto Rico, I saw two, and they were in town, and someone had them on a leash. They're, all, yeah, they're introduced there, but, too. But they're everywhere down there, but huh? we didn't see any. But this last time we were in Mexico, we were somewhere, and there was a whole bunch of them. I can't remember where we were, but there was eight. Oh, we were waiting for the boat to come get us. And there was like six yes, of them by the yes, boat dock. by the boat dock. We I remember landing in, in the airport in Puerto Rico, and they were sitting on the airport, like, where the planes landed. <laughs> so they're they're pretty pretty common um, in areas where, again, tropical. They're very adaptive, more. too. They're very they? adaptive, uh, adaptable animals, and that's all part of whether a species is going to be invasive or not is – how adaptable are they, and can they live alongside people? Mm-hmm. That's the main thing, you know, and some of those animals are very capable of doing it, and some are not. Um, so there's a lot of variables uh, that come into play whether a species can be invasive and, 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 and is adaptable enough, like a rat. Right. To live anywhere, right? I saw a video yesterday of a at South Padre Island of a damn alligator. It was in the in Laguna Madre right there off of South Padre. You see those, the houses and shit right in the clear waters. Damn alligator sitting in there. Yeah. Hmm. How many snakes can you like reintroduce? Like like you said, you take them and you'll reintroduce them. And do you split them up amongst? Obviously you do. But like how many could you introduce into a like a den that has 30 snakes in it? It's It's something that, again, it's very complicated. You have to look at the habitat dynamic and... I basically judge it off what I feel is the right number. It's some arbitrary number that really, none of it's scientifically proven or anything. Right. It's just what I feel. I look at the habitat and I say, oh, okay, there's there's a lot of cover for them. They're not going to get picked off by hawks and owls. There's, um, there's a lot of cactus that have, they have a lot of rodent middens in them. So I know that the food source is here. I don't worry too much about water. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's, it's really, I judge it off of those two things and or base it off of that and say okay i know that there's usually 30 rattlesnakes here and if i'm more successful doing it in the winter time Mm -hmm. doing it in the summertime is it's it's suicide for the snake because they don't recognize anything and they start to wander and eventually they're just gonna succumb to whatever oh really yeah 
They're they're most people they're intelligent yet very stupid. So <laughs> rattlesnakes. Not arguing that with you. <laughs> rattlesnakes, as far as any species that I've ever messed with or found or anything, once they become successful, they become very very habitual. Meaning, I can find the same snakes year after year in the same spot on pretty much the same date. And it's all because of they've had some sort of success there. So what will happen then is if I see this snake for two or three years and let's say I chuck a rock at it and it put it, I put this snake in some sort of stressful situation, mm-hmm. I will never see that snake there again. Really? Never. So they'll just abandon that side. Yes. They're, they're, they won't move far, right. but they're, they're, they're not that's there. not there anymore. Fucking, how did, I mean, this goes like to, to any, like even like birds. We, we had a guy in here yesterday and he, uh, he tracks bird, he tracks ducks and geese with like geo trackers. And like, he's got birds that will fly from North Carolina to the tip top of Alaska. And like he said, like they were within 300 yards of where they were. How the hell does the snake know that this is where he's supposed to be? I think it's all at the beginning. So like I mentioned earlier, they, they roughly have 12 babies. And that's that's what's specifically dim, Western Diamondbacks. Um, it's They have that many babies, and it's to account for a higher mortality rate. Not all mm-hmm. those babies are going to live. Right. And, in fact, you know, probably very few of them are, especially in these sort of conditions that we've had these last few years. It's just it's too hard on them. So it's... I think it's kind of a trial and error type thing. They, right. you know, they catch the scent of a rodent or a lizard or something like that, and they'll say, "Okay, let me let me try this." And if they become successful there, you know, now they have a spot, and they move around to do that. Obviously, they have to have places to hide as well. So, it's I think it's just kind of a. Obviously, they're they know what to do to survive, mm-hmm. but it's just having the opportunity to do it. Do we know like what the max distance is that a snake will travel from the den? Like from the den, will it go 200 yards in like a circumference? So it, it, it all plays back to the habitat dynamics right. of, of what it is. So I have a big male that I've watched for several years and unfortunately he's no longer there. I don't know why I, I watched him for year after year after year for a lot of years and he would never move more than about 50 yards from the den the entire year. Really? And But then you have some, there was uh, some radio telemetry work done up on the on the Yano Estacado and with prairie rattlesnakes, and where, where the male was found, the next time they found him, he was 3.9 miles away. No shit. But think about that up there. There's nothing. It's just right. flat. There's, there's no resources really there. So they do have to travel that kind of, that kind of distance. So... Around here, the snakes probably are traveling a, a, a fair amount away from the den, whereas some of the stuff around Albany, Shackleford County, that's northern Taylor County, they're probably they're not having going to go far. too far. Everything they have is, is right there. Right. So Right. Yeah, because, like, things have got to be pretty. And, like, how does the snake know where to go? It just starts wandering until it finds. Like, if a snake was here in this tree patch and it used up all the resources, say there's not enough for how many snakes are there, and it's like, fuck it, we're hightailing it across this big-ass wheat field. Like, does it just go until it reaches another tree tree grove? Uh, kind of. It's they base a lot of that stuff off of off of the scent, and food is important to them. So they but can shelter, smell. yeah. But shelter is more important to them. So they've never done a study on how far a snake will go. Yeah, like, that's what he said. Three point nine. One. In, but I mean, that's it. That's the record of all records. I, I, don't miles. Know, I don't know the record of it, but that those are just ones that I know specifically. But it, again, it's just going to depend. So like if, say you were up in Wyoming or something like that, and who knows how far those snakes would travel? Who knows? Um, I'm just surprised they hadn't put telemetry on them to figure that out. Because, they did. But I'm surprised that they haven't done more studies on yeah. that. Because oh. I'm curious, other than just one snake, there's got that four miles is a pretty big range for it's something that's huge. crawling around on its fucking belly. That's huge. Yeah. I mean, that's, but then you think like, okay, so some of the snakes that we go after in Arizona, they, they probably have a, a, a core area that's probably less than 30 yards the entire year. The females, males are going to wander, wander around, you know, looking for girlfriends and stuff. But some of the females, I found one last year that I saw three years ago. How did you a, know it was the same snake? You can tell by looking at them. You can? Yeah. Their patterns oh, yeah. are unique. Yeah. So it's like a fingerprints in your hand, not there's there's variations on their patterns or whether their tail 
the line is broken, so there's changes. Can you imagine Andy S. being that, going to Arizona and you guys driving, going vacation to catch snakes? Well, no, I just yeah. like the, <laughs> that's um, just crazy. Well, no, it's just it's crazy to me. Like, how long would you have to like study a snake to like have its pattern memorized to where you're like, okay, that's the same snake I saw a year ago? Uh, if you can find a female one time, you can generate. So the female you can find. And then also the very dominant males, those are the ones that are going to stick to their core areas a little bit more. The The females, if you find, find her one time, you can go back pretty much to the date and find her there again, as long pretty, as you don't stress her out. What What are the little snakes that are real aggressive? Masagas? Masasagas, yeah. Masasagas. Are they, they're pretty aggressive, aren't they? The, that's, uh, that's a wives' tale, too? They, they're defensive. Most and, snakes don't want to jack with you. They want to get away from you. I did. That's, I was kind of hinting that on that earlier. Video. I did. Walked up to 50 rattlesnakes, and, and I can go out in the pastures and, and, you know, whatever and find rattlesnakes, no problem. But the reason I wanted to do it on that specific road, one, it's close to the snake facility, and two, it's a rattlesnake crossing a road. That's probably going to be the most vulnerable place he's, he's going to be. Yeah. So if I was going to get chased, that's where that would happen at. Obviously, I knew it wasn't going to happen. But doing that, approached 50 rattlesnakes. Obviously, I didn't get chased because snakes don't chase people. Um, very few of them even postured up to strike. Very few of them rattled. It's Snakes are not... Everything that you've probably heard about snakes, rattlesnakes specifically, is probably either been exaggerated or is completely false. You, That's the thing. The, 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 the story now is they don't rattle as much anymore because of the wild pigs. Yeah. Have you heard that before? Yeah, I hear it is that, every day. Is that true or false? It's completely false completely false. Now, I don't... Our encounters... Rattlesnakes don't rattle as much as they used to, it seemed like. I've not been Why around enough rattlesnakes to know... When I, when I was a kid, the only encounters I had, they were... Yeah. I mean, you could be 50 so, yards from them in the vibrations. You very seldom... I mean, there's times I see them laying around here until you poke or prod them, they don't rattle much. It's the it's the situation in which they're encountered. If... if uh, do y'all hunt deer? Yeah. Yes, sir. Okay. If you had this monster buck you were waiting for and you, you know, you fed him protein for four years and you were just waiting, you get all decked out in your camouflage and all this, and then the deer comes out and you start yelling at it. That's stupid, right? Mm -hmm. And so why would a rattlesnake give himself away by rattling right. when they rely on their camouflage? That's their number one defense. So it's all in the situation in which they're encountered. If they feel like they're invisible. They're not going to move. They're not going to rattle. They're not going to do anything. Another thing to kind of that plays into that is, you know, we keep harping on or herping adventures in the Southwest, but there are zero feral pigs over there. None of those snakes rattle over there. Just, really? No. Very, Even over there? No. So most of their behavior is based on camouflage. Like what I tell people this is a snake is actually a physically fragile animal. If you think mm -hmm. about it, except for some of the large constrictors, it's a, a spine. I mean, I'm pretty sure you guys have seen a skeleton of a snake. I mean, it's a it's a skull and ribs and a spine. I mean, they're not an alpha. The, no, they're, they're physically mean. fragile. I mean, you can easily dispatch one with pretty much anything. Their main line of defense is camouflage. Is why there's so much variety when you look at them. They're brown. The ones, you know, in certain locations are white to match the rocks where they're found. They don't move. They curl up. They know you're there. They can feel your vibrations. The chances are the ones that you have seen, for every one you have seen, you have passed hundreds. It's That's... the reality of of the truth. And probably closer than you would like. Yeah, that's what scares me <laughs> and the most. so their line of defense is camouflage. There is nothing to gain for them to bite us because the reality is venom doesn't work that quick. Even if something got bit by it, I can still kill it. And mm -hmm. so it doesn't benefit the snake to expose itself to bite someone for no reason because the main purpose of venom is food, is acquisition of food, not defense. I mean, even some of the other snakes that you see that are venomous have warning. I mean, if it didn't want to warn you, a cobra wouldn't spread a hood. If they don't want to warn you, a coral snake wouldn't have bright colors. I mean, do you have a snake that is designed with a rattle? Like, mm -hmm. like, how crazy is that, right? Like, might not like snakes, but it's got a rattle on it. And all that, What's that is one? based on... It's the prettiest on, snake there is. It's a southwestern speckled rattlesnake. Yeah. But see the rock that it's... Oh, yeah, yeah. So that's all based looks, on yeah, camouflage. Yeah. 
doesn't even want to expose himself. Now, if it feels like it has been seen, then he's like, well, I got no choice. I'm going to announce my presence. They'll puff up. You know, they'll ass up. A lot of it, they'll strike. It's a bluff. I mean, if you keep persisting on it, um, yeah, they're going to defend themselves. Just any snake will defend itself, even mm -hmm. a, a garter snake. It just happens so that the rattlesnake has a little bit of a better weapon on it, right, if it needed to. It's just like a bee, right? Yeah. And that's what I tell people is, is they're they're not aggressive, they're defensive. Any animal will defend itself. I mean, if I, you know, this dog right here, if, you know, if I cornered it and, and you know, abused it, it will have no choice and will bite you. Right. Just like any animal. Any animal will, will defend itself. And I've, you know, handled many different species from around the world. Um, everything from, you know, cats and birds that have had a, I mean, you know, I've restricted cranes and things like that, you They're know, they bastards. will turn around and bite you. I yeah. mean, <laughs> you know, it's the, the amount of damage isn't going to be as great as, you know, if I got, you know, nailed by a, a cassowary, which is a huge bird of Australia, as opposed to, you know, a crane, but it, it just, it just, you know, depending on the species you're dealing with. So that's what I tell people is they're not, I've never heard of a story of, of a truly aggressive snake. Mm -hmm. um, and we've worked with hundreds. I've worked with hundreds of different individuals from different taxa, different species. And if it hasn't happened to the people that work with them and put themselves in the position every day, it's hard to believe that the average person that is doesn't know snakes that well has encountered that sort of behavior so right. um that's what i tell people is it's a lot of stories when people say oh i got attacked by a snake starts off with i did this this and i asked her, what did you do <laughs> i said well i found the snake and then i saw it it tried to get away from me then i got the world's smallest branch <laughs> and i tried to beat it to death and then it turned around and bit me. Oh. That's not right. that's self defense. That's yeah. not chasing. That's the animal trying to get away. We try to grab it. It did what it needed to do as a last resort. And you got bit. Yeah. Because you put yourself in the position. What's the wildest? What's the meanest animal you've encountered? Period. That you've had to deal with. Oh man, I've dealt with a lot of things. <laughs> I'm trying to remember. I mean. I would say some of the the big cats um, working in zoological institutions. I mean, big cats. Some of the big birds are, you know, can be pretty pretty dangerous. I'm talking about like you know like ratites, like like you know cassowaries and things like that. Um, but really, again, it's just a lot of the situations. A, a large elk I had mm -hmm. to deal with scared the crap out of me. Honestly, um, I ended up in the enclosure by accident. It was my era. Um, but again, a lot of those animals were just fine unless I contained myself with them in an area where they felt that they needed to get defensive um, and, and defend themselves from what they thought was, you know, a life or death situation because they don't know any better. Right. Um, so I would say those probably big cats when we're having to move big cats and stuff like that, probably. Mm. I've got uh, turkey seasons coming up. So I'm in the woods a lot, sitting on trees and stuff. And I've always had that thought, like you just said, for every, I've not, I've not seen a ton of rattlesnakes, but like, I'm always, whenever I sit down, I'm like, how many are close to me right now? Like within 20 feet. Yeah. I don't know if I want to know that number. And that's the thing. They don't, they want to, you know, stay concealed. The, announcing their presence with with a big predator yeah. just puts them out there to be killed. Yeah. So so they're gonna tuck in and stay still um, if they feel that they're seen, um, or you know they've been you know up, you know you move things and and it has no choice but to flee. That's when they're gonna announce their their presence. And again, most of those times it involves them fleeing under a bush, going down a hole. It's only when they feel that they, they can't retreat somewhere that they're going to defend themselves. And again, they're not the most mobile creatures. I mean, as far as like speed. Yeah. You know, we deal with faster animals. You know, I mean, even your cattle is going to be a lot more faster than, than a snake. So when people say, oh, snakes chase me, I mean, you must be really out of shape. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, for a rattlesnake to chase me, it's a limbless, limbless animal. I mean, there's some species like coach whips and whip snakes that are fast. Then again, they're not venomous, but you know, they're, they're, there's no, they can't eat us like rattlesnakes can't. There's no benefit 
to to being able to 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 hurt us. But I've always heard of like water moccasins chasing canoe to canoe goers, climbing yeah. in their boat with them. You hear a lot of things. What's no, this? I had a freaking snake try to get in my tube one time. What were you doing? I was fishing. So they'll now I don't think he was trying to get in there and eat me, but that's some bitch come up to my tube trying to get out of the water, and I beat the hell out of him with a damn fishing stick and got my ass in the truck and left. <laughs> so, so a lot of times when that happens, they see again they're not the brightest of creatures. They'll see something floating and they'll investigate. Is that something that like a log you can or perch something up on? they can perch on? It's not. Yeah, so well, much he wasn't there. perching on my ass. That was <laughs> Honestly, yeah. You're like no, but you know, so a lot of those species of snakes, water snakes, or water moccasins they tend to rest over logs and and structures overhanging water because again when they are threatened their first line of defense and if you see a water snake that's what it's going to do it's going to dive into the water mm. yeah, my ass is getting out of the water yeah <laughs> so you know that's typically typically what what they're going to do so a lot of also we cast a shadow um which normally means that you know there's there's something to hide under so that can be taken also from a snake you know trying to get away um you know that they might approach us but as far as like chasing to defend themselves from from a threat that's not now of the 50 rattlesnakes that you went up to what was the common response that they gave you don't move they just mm -hmm. tuck they, down they, and even if they were on the crawl so say like how was this done like you just you just let them out in the middle of this road how was this experiment no these were wild snakes oh they yeah, you got a place that's got 50 fucking rattlesnakes by your house well, I mean, there's a lot more than that. I'm going down this. This road is eight miles long. I don't so, give a shit. That's <laughs> yeah, scary. and it's in pristine habitat. So this was not. I thought you like had the rattlesnakes, and you were like just seeing what they would do. No, these. I were, thought you planted them. There. No, these were wild rattlesnakes oh. that that were crossing the road. So that's what I would do. I would just basically approach all these fifty different snakes and see what they would do. God, I'd hate to snake. live on that road. Nobody does. Thank God. That's why there's so many rattlesnakes right well, there. Well, they, it's kind of crappy. Were you walking down the road and saw them, or were you walking through the brush along the road? No, I just drive into my pickup, and you see them in the road, and you get out of your pickup, and you walk up to them. Jesus. And, and then you saw 50 rattlesnakes on an eight hour, on an eight mile stretch of road. Not in one day. This took like a couple oh, of weeks. Oh, okay. Yeah. I thought you did this shit like in a 15 or 20 minute experiment. No, 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 no. <laughs> that's like, no. Bitch, that's a place you don't want to go. You need <laughs> no. to nuke that place. <laughs> So, so, but most of the time you'd walk up to them and they're, it's just camouflage. Yeah, they'll sit still, even though they are exposed. obviously very exposed on a caliche road, they, yeah. they stand out. So they would do that. And then I would basically take a step closer to them mm -hmm. and a little bit closer. And then I have a snake hook with me and occasionally I would prod one or something like that just to see if I could get any sort of behavior out of this snake. Most of them, I would say well above 50% would not rattle they wouldn't do anything they would simply turn and head straight back to the to try the to get back trying to, to get the brush yep. what did uh how this is completely off subject but it is subject during the vietnam war that had to be one of the major things our troops had to deal with was the cobras and all that shit or whatever the hell was over there snake wise there's a lot over there um i don't know how much it would i mean if you think about how dense that place is I don't know how, how much they would actually have dealt with them. And there's a lot of arboreal stuff over there, too. So one of my buddies, his dad was in Vietnam, and he said they were going through a rice paddies or some shit in a Jeep mm -hmm. and looked up, and there was a freaking cobra sitting there that popped its head up. I guess they about run over it. He said they cut into that son bitch with a machine gun. I would have, too, scared <laughs> the piss out of me. But with those bunker rat guys that crawled through those tunnels and shit and all them, had to be all kinds of snakes and shit there. I mean, yeah, they probably been. probably definitely encountered them. I mean, if they're crawling around brush and mm. stuff like that. I think the you know the reason why people in Asia again, it's a lot of cultural differences. Like like you said, when you went to India, there was like a lot of different cultural differences than it would be here. And the reason why a lot of uh, snake bites occur in these areas is because a lot of times they're I mean they're have almost no clothing on. They're walking around barefoot um on these rice paddies they're working without any any shoes or sneakers um there's also you know religious practices there in certain countries where you know they bring out the snakes especially in india um and they bring them out in pots and they actually have uh festivals where they just basically get hundreds and hundreds of cobras mm. um and they i think they put dyes on them and they worship them and stuff like that but you know bites occur right you know anytime you put humans to purposely work with venomous snakes or any sort of animal 
or anything, you you put yourself in a situation where you you're more likely to get into an accident or get you know you're racing right or a race car driver you're more likely yeah. to get into an accident um if you're you know any anything that you do you know uh i can't has imagine its, has its risks freaking but getting a lot a of those countries um also don't have a lot of medical uh good medical assistance um it's rural it's very rural and they still rely on like going to a you know witch doctor or things like that instead of going to the hospital so it's usually a last resort you know hours or days even days this is why before they seek medical attention and then this just goes back into like you know you get bit you're gonna die in five seconds no you know it's a lot of these people wait days and that is the worst thing you can do so how many i'm just <clears throat> I, I know what the numbers are but how many fatalities do you think we have from snakes in the united states per year we're talking also, about heart attack and people shitting themselves <laughs> also or just like dying i think that would that would fall into the category um, yeah um, all, all snakes all venomous snakes in the, in united, in the united states 20, yes. 22. 22. i'm gonna that. take the under i'm gonna go 15. Yo, ready way off so both of us so it's single digits uh so in 2022 uh dr spencer green he's a toxicologist down around houston and he's involved in and he's doing great, great work with a lot of venom. And in 2022, there were three fatalities in the United States. Three. Two of them could have been completely avoided. One was a, a snake handler, I want to say, in one of the Carolinas, I believe. And he was doing with a timber rattlesnake, kind of what you saw a homeboy doing with that cobra. You know, yeah, doing yeah, like that, yeah. free handling these snakes, no restraints, no nothing. And he got bit, and mm -hmm. he was an older guy, and he died. Bet he didn't go try to get help either. Probably not. Um, there was another guy down in Freer at their rattlesnake roundup, that, and I don't know if they they do all these like little circus tricks. I remember hearing they, about this dude. Yeah, I think he wrapped it around his neck or something like that. And they that. crawl in the sleeping bag with him. Yeah, and yeah shit. they do all sorts of dumb <laughs> yeah. shit, and they they I'm taunt glad you snakes. Said that, not they, me. they do. It's, <laughs> it's stupid, and you know they'll taunt snakes with balloons and get them to strike and do all right. this all this crap. Well, he got bit down there, and, and he died. And then, unfortunately, the, the other one was in Colorado, and it was a, I think he was a nine-year-old kid, and he got bit, but he went into anaphylactic shock. So it was a, it was a quick so out of, so for him. Three people. So, so out of those three, only one was in the wild. Was a, what we consider legitimate. a legitimate bite where yeah. someone wasn't harassing or putting themselves in a situation yeah. where they got bit. How the many kid was, you know... And that's what I tell people is, is more people die from choking on an eraser, yeah. from slipping and falling and getting attacked by cattle or, you know, or injuries coconut. related or, you know, falling off a horse and the horse kicks you than it is. So how big of a problem is it reality when statistics and science tells us we had three casualties yes. that year as opposed to everything else? So really just, are they one, as, really just one. I mean, the other two correct. have an asterisk by it. Correct. And so this fear that we have for these animals, it's a lot based on our cultural, mm -hmm. religious, and also, you know, based on what we were taught as, as kids. Um, when we are learning about these animals, we fear them because we don't understand them because the facts show otherwise. Three, one legitimate. So, so when people say that people are dying left and right, the reality is they're not. How many people got bit in the United States by venomous snakes last year, I wonder. Uh, that would be the interesting thing. Is it a thousand people and we had one death? No, it's more than three? that. It's yeah. more it's, than one thousand. Usually, so if you take, let's say, the last five years, we don't have, well, let's go back. Uh, Spencer hasn't put out the the statistics for 2023 yet. Um, I, I guess it just takes a long time to compile all this information and put it out. But in 2022, let's go back from there five years. It's usually going to be, and this is kind of a wide gap number, but usually between five and 8,000 people across the United and, States. And, and, we're, and we're losing three people, two by idiots. You're right on the nuts. And one. Yeah. And you're, so on the top end, it says 8,000. Yeah. So, I mean, you're right there. So see, that makes, that makes someone like me that's got a fear of snakes feel better. So if my fat ass gets bit, there's a good chance I'm going to live have, still. It's, it's, yeah, what's going to kill? Expensive. What's going to kill? What's going to kill you is the medical yeah. bill when you look at it. You get a heart <laughs> attack. They screw us on but, everything. But anyway. yeah, that's that's what's going to scare you. Of and this is this is not to say that rattlesnakes are you know fluffy puppies or anything. Right. It's to say that are they dangerous? They can be if if 
if you put yourself in into that dangerous situation and do they deserve our respect absolutely it's not like we're we're telling people oh the snakes aren't dangerous you can go pet them and do all that no that's not what we're saying but just the natural behavior of a snake it's it's not it's not something people should worry about and like i said earlier almost everything you've probably heard about a snake there's some sort of misinformation involved in that right what's the death rates i wonder in somewhere like taipei well, it's going to be a lot it's different a lot because more medical. They have crappy medical. They but are. if you get to a facility, there are most every you can survive a cobra bite if you get to a facility. You can survive a cobra bite without going to a facility. Don't do that. I'm not going to. <laughs> okay, but you you can, and that's the thing. So, I told y'all uh, last time I was on here, I told y'all a story about a Hamlin job. I was underneath the house. There were four rattlesnakes. We got one out. He was helping me. He was outside of the hole. He Gave him, I gave him one snake. He got it out. The second one was very, very agitated. I gave it to him. It was the largest snake under there, probably four foot somewhere in there. And I have the video of it. And I said, do you have it? And I said, I think you're a little bit too far back or something. And he said, no, I'm good. Well, what he did, he, he adjusted the tongs to get leverage to get it out of the hole, and it, it bit him on the wrist. And... God damn it, Tony. <laughs> um, did you go to the doctor? I did, yes. Good, so, for, you. good for you. Well, there's, there's something else to say here in just a minute, but I'm allergic to antivenom. Um, the, the crow fab, I'm allergic to. So there's no point in me going to a hospital unless it is like a very, very serious envenomation. Because you're going to get sicker from the antivenom yes. than you would just yes. a regular. Yeah, and that you know they're going to bump my bill up to something that's – astronomical that nobody can afford and they're just basically going to give me pain medicine and stuff so i just choose not to i'll choose to suffer it out but the interesting thing about him is he, he's a big guy and by the time i got out of the hole which couldn't have been more than two or three minutes he was completely passed out on the floor completely and the ranch hand he was like oh, he's dead i think he's dead i was like no he ain't dead he said are you sure i said Pretty sure. <laughs> so we had to load his big ass up and get him to the ambulance. Did you CPR on him? No, I ain't kissing him. No, I, <laughs> so did you go unconscious? Or you just pass out because you were so, scared. It wasn't. So everybody's body reacts different to venom. <clears throat> so for whatever reason, you know, my reaction to venom is, I guess, it messes with my maybe my blood pressure or whatever. But I pass out. Like I wasn't. I was more angry than anything else. To be honest with you. When I got bit by that snake, because I did a stupid mistake, and I was pretty pissed off. How many it. times have you passed out uh, by getting bit by a snake? I think that was the only one I fully, but I remember getting bit by the other ones and wanting to pass out. You know when you get pass out, I would. You, you know when you get that you're you're zoning out and then you're coming back, and I I laid down on the floor, and so I would fall. I remember two other bites being that way, um, but I didn't fully. It was close. Um, I could feel it. And, um, but that one, I mean, that one had me out, but I remember, you know, when I got bit and I told, I was like, man, I could, I sat down, I think it was like a chair or something there conveniently or a bench. And I, you were on I, your hands and knees. Was I? And then you like lean back on your, okay. Yeah. Then I just I remember, I mean, I don't remember. I just passed out. I remember waking up and then a bunch of people were, were dragging me. I got up and then I feel like I passed out again. Um, and then I woke up. And then someone was, I think it was the the ranch hand or him, someone was throwing me in the vehicle. I literally just threw It was me out. and one of the workers. And um, they were just like, drive. Drive as fast as you can to the main road. Because we were like, you know, in the middle of nowhere. And so they were trying to drive to the main road where the ambulance was, was going to wait. And that's, they drove me uh, to, I believe, Hendrix, where, you know, they administered antivenom. Because it's a native snake. So obviously they had the antivenom. Uh, and it was, the, one of the things that was kind of scary... I, it was during COVID, oh. so they weren't letting anybody into the hospitals. And, you know, his girlfriend was able to go up, but he was just, you know, he was in la-la land because of the, the bite. And so she's texting me. I'm, I'm waiting downstairs because I can't go in. And that's a scary thing. It's I know, I know quite a bit about snake venom and what it does and how it does, but it's when they're starting to ask all these questions about him, there's a lot of things that – medical professionals don't know about snake bites it's almost like i don't i don't know 
what to do. So I'm just going to get on Google and, <laughs> and see what I can get off of here. Okay, this tells me to give him 12 vials of anti-venom. Like, what if his body didn't need that much? And one of the things they asked there, you know, when I was, you know, awake and they had rolled me in there, and I remember my girlfriend is, you know, one of the medical professionals there were, were talking about the word, my least favorite word was, you know, fasciotomy. And I looked at my girlfriend, I said, if I'm out, <laughs> yeah. you make sure that they do not perform a fasciotomy. I mean, that's an outdated procedure. That is really not necessary, and that's what you mentioned earlier. Where fillet they kind them of open. fillet your, yeah. you know, your arm open, and it's ninety nine percent. It's unnecessary. It's do mostly when you have what's called compart a true compartment syndrome from like an accident. Then a lot of times that's not necessary. It causes extreme damage, and I mean horrific scars. Obviously, survive just fine without it. So um, it's one of those things that, like he said, the medical people, even though you think. They would be very knowledgeable since this is, you know, a common snake that's in our area. Um, there's a lot of misinformation in there um, being thrown that I was hearing some of the medical professionals where I had to come out and say, hey, you know, I'm a snake guy. Please listen to what I'm saying. You know? mm -hmm. And my girlfriend is very aware also, you know, of some things. And so, you know, I was telling him. You know, telling her because I don't think you were allowed to go in there. I wasn't. I wasn't. And so I was worried. I, mean, I would have liked him to be present there, obviously. And I was just like, okay, just if I pass out again, you know, I don't want to wake up with a filleted, you know, arm. Yeah. So my dad had a fireman he was friends with that had that. He got bit by a uh, a cotton mouth, and they gave him rattlesnake venom. Ooh, that, that should have worked. It didn't, and they so, cut him from the from here all the way to the bottom of it, middle of his finger split him well, open. Was it, how long ago was that? Oh, this was probably 30, 40 years ago. Okay. Well, that may be why. That why. But yeah. they they were giving him the wrong shit. Yeah. And, they, and he told him, he said, no, 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 I got bit by, it maybe got bit by a copperhead and they yeah. was giving him rattlesnake so, can of venom to, or something. But. So back in the days, and that's a good thing with today's anti-venom, back in the days there was what's called a, a monovalent. Mono meaning one, where the venom or the anti-venom was designed for one particular snake. And so unless you were very snake savvy and knew how to identify snakes, you say, okay, I got bit by a rattlesnake or cottonmouth or whatever, that venom was, or any venom was specifically designed for that one snake. But because with advancements in, in you know, medicine, a lot of the anti-venoms now are polyvalent, so many. Um, so that way, if someone does get bit, as long as it's you know your native uh, species, except for the coral snake, that's its own because the venom is so unique and it's different, um, that polyvalent will cover multiple species. So that way, if you get bit by a copper, western dimeback, cottonmouth, you no longer have to identify what it is. Um, that antivenom will cover all those species. It's, you know, they'll cross is what they call it. Um, so that way, you can, you, if you do get bit, you don't have to, you know, know what type of snake right. it is. You know, unless it's like a you know coral snake, but um, and that makes things a lot easier for accidents like like that. If I had to guess. That's probably what happened. So how do they how do that? Do they do it? The do are they introducing the venom of multiple into that horse or goat yep. or whatever it is? Uh -huh. And some of them are very similar. Um, so they'll cross. So like uh, the the amitivip, they are made in Mexican Mexico. It will they use several snake species that are very similar. And so if you get bit by this group per se of venomous snakes. It'll cover that entire group, but snake venom is very complex. So that's the thing; it doesn't always work. It, it, always. So, for example, a good example would be a Russell's viper. There are some that live in India, and there's some that live in Sri Lanka, and the venoms are different, even though it's the same different, same species of snake. So there's variations in venom in a population of just the snakes. So when they made any venom for that snake, they used a population from India, not Sri Lanka. Mm -hmm. Happened so that when people got bit in Sri Lanka, the any venom that was produced from the snakes in India would not work very well. And so they still had a lot of issues, mortality and a lot of uh, uh, you know issues with that any venom until they started using the venom specifically from the Sri Lankan population. So you have very weird things like that with snakes, where even in the United States, you know, Mojave rattlesnakes from different areas will have different compositions of their venom. So it's, I wish I could give you an all 
answer to that, mm -hmm. but it's it's a range. It's just very complex. It's very hard. So where did the technology? Where did the where did the theory come from that if we fillet your arm open, where did that come from? Is it just it's, does your tissue yeah, rot so away? It's to relieve your. It's cold compartment syndrome. So it's to relieve. So one of the main side effects of being bitten by a venomous snake, except for certain species like 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 mambas, for example, or very neurotoxic, is swelling. Right. So anytime you have swelling, it restricts blood flow. So when you have that extreme swelling, um, especially around your extremities, like your fingers, you know, these blood vessels, it's already a very, you know, narrow place to try to get blood in, right? So when you have this swelling, um, what, what will tend to happen is that, you know, you have your blood gets restricted there. I mean, and you have no good blood flow, so your finger will rot because basically um, you don't have good flow of blood there. And, and that's where all that came from is trying to relieve the pressure. So by uh, opening up the skin, it's kind of like a hot dog, basically. It mm -hmm. just kind of opens up and it relieves that pressure um, to, to prevent, you know, loss of your digits or whatnot. But the reality is, is that the antivenom that is produced nowadays is so good that it will penetrate those fine extremities and prevent a lot of this damage and the fact is you know anytime someone gets bit by a venomous snake he, he, what i you know i know we do our things that you know we <laughs> he sleeps at all for you know i've you know this the, the western diamondback was the only one i received that even from because it was such a large snake and and i mean I, I didn't want to risk where it bit there was some damage mm -hmm. um and i didn't want to risk losing my possibly losing my hand um you know so i i chose to do that obviously um but it's it's one of those things. It's just it, receiving the antivenom right away uh, prevents a lot of that damage um, from occurring, and that's what it's designed for. You know, like a famous uh, person that deals with uh, envenomations um, says, "Time is time is tissue." So the more the faster you go to receive treatment, um, the better your your success will be from recovery and faster. So a long time ago, that medical procedure probably made sense because the antivenom wasn't as good as it is today. But with today, it's it's an outdated It's kind of like bloodletting. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I mean, they didn't know. I mean, they've learned as they've went. In real yeah. i got a question off the snakes before we get off this thing. i got a question for you. What's the weirdest shit you've seen under a house? <laughs> you never know. You never know. You never know. I mean, what have you seen under a house that's really weird? Have you seen any lost treasures? Not yet. So nothing I of found value. That, that bullet was cool. Yeah. I thought that was neat. Yeah, but nothing uh, of value cool really. Dildos, baby. <laughs> Who the fuck puts a dildo under the house? Oh, they'll well, never, they'll never find it. Probably. Probably. I mean, that's really though. I mean, did you get caught in the act and you threw it up under the? I don't know what they're doing. Yeah, but I mean, yeah. Uh, God dang it, Janice's dildos under the house again. And it's not, it it's there. not easy. I mean, like most places, like for me to get under my house, like I got to move all my kids' shit out of his closet. I got to get to that crawl space. Yeah. Like it's not an easy task to hide something <laughs> under the house. No, it's there's there's a lot of weird stuff. There's a lot of weird dead animals. Like well, I can't remember where that was, but it was this place that was just way out in the middle of nowhere. And I get under there, and there's like this giant bass skull under there. Like, how the hell did that get under there? It was just just a, a fish. Stuff. Yeah, makes you wonder if a cat didn't get it and drag it under. There, there. wasn't any water anywhere nearby, so oh, I don't yeah, know if a, a guy. I, it was just bizarre. Um, all sorts of stuff. You really never know. I always because I had to crawl under my house. Uh, it's when did I when did I do that? It was a year ago, eighteen months ago, two years. It doesn't matter. But I've been around my house a lot, and like, there's no big holes that go that lead into getting under my house. But when I was under there, I looked and there was, I convinced myself it was a bull snake, mm -hmm. <laughs> but like he was, so like crawl space is here and like I look over and he's, Ooh, fuck that. he's, he's curled up, mm. you know, probably from here to the door ish. So I'm like, okay, whatever. He's fine. So anyway, I do mm -hmm. what I got. I do what mm. I got to do under the house, mm. crawl, crawl back out, shine my flashlight. He's still there. I didn't finish the job, so I had to go to the supply house, got what I needed, psyched myself back up to go back under the house, and he wasn't there. Oh, hell no. <laughs> oh, hell no. Uh -uh. So now, like, I'm using my flashlight. Mm. Like, the first thing I do is I always look at that, you know, that that beam, raft, that beam that's, you know, right mm -hmm. above me. Never did see the snake ever again. 
That was the last time I've been under the house, but like there was no like there was no light protruding in from a like and he seemed like a, a big enough bull snake. He wasn't a baby by any means. Is it is is the stem wall made out of is it solid concrete or is yeah. it cinder blocks? It's concrete. There's, so are there cinder blocks in there <clears throat> holding the floor up like on the joist or any of that? Uh I think uh I think it was it looks like a solid cylinder. Like um you see these things, it's like it's it's like a it's a hole it's a c- yeah. cylinder and you pour concrete in it and it looks like that's what is under holding some of the jo- uh hmm. floor beams up but like i was looking around like because I, I looked kind of like by where the air conditioner comes in where the water sp- spout is on the outside it's all like cut pretty tight hmm. around there so i don't know how he got under there i bet no you talent. sure looking for his ass all time you're working hmm. wouldn't you <clears throat> i just blocked it out of my mind and did what i had to i do. couldn't have done that shit that done way for it's me like a, it's like a bad horror movie i guess to you guys when you turn oh, around it's there and then you turn around and, and like you know he's, he's far enough away and like you said like he's not gonna come out after me no. mm, but, hell but no. no i just i could not figure out mm. and i still like i walk around the house and i'm like where the fuck did this snake get mm. into my house underneath mm. my house at no. Usually when I when I crawl underneath the house and I see like a big pile of rattlesnakes, I start licking my lips because I know it's just going to be a fun day. Oh, oof, good time. <laughs> what's the, mm. I mean, what's the sketchiest situation that you've been on? Because, I mean, like, you know, there's some houses like you're probably just getting your body under there. Like there's no extra wiggle room. The worst one was Maljamar, New Mexico. Still to this day, that's the weirdest, most dangerous underneath the house job I've, I've been on. And it was... It was a pretty big house, but the way that they did the the stem walls, they did them like every 10 by 10 feet. Mm-hmm. And instead of piling up, like you said, those cylinders and things like that, they basically piled them up with big limestone rocks. So obviously there's not a whole lot of room in 10 by 10, and a lot of the snakes were very large, and I had several crawl over my body. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. It's mm-hmm. Yeah, that... that do you freak out when it crawls over your body? No, that would you be, don't. That'd be stupid. Well, of course it would be, mm. but it's also like a human reaction. Like if I felt a snake crawling over me, I'm jerking my legs back, the, which is going to agitate it more. Yeah, the the first time I had one actually crawl over my leg, and it was one that I didn't even see because we were underneath a trailer house and it had like one of those moisture barrier tarps under there that they put, mm-hmm. and the snakes were under it, and I was clearing them out. I had I had like a little gut hook, and I cut like half moons in the in the plastic and that's how i get them out and i didn't even see this one and it crawled over my legs and i asked the kid working for me i said there's a rattlesnake crawling over my legs huh he said yep (laughs) and he said what do you want me to do what do you want me to do he was freaking out more than me and i was like just let it crawl let it crawl let it crawl Mm. and it crawled off but yeah the mountain mar in mexico and it was it was a bad deal i didn't i wasn't a fan of that one just wasn't a lot of room and there was a lot of big snakes and not a good way to get them out. Right, because, like, that's the thing. Like, you're under a house. You're on your hands and knees. This one, I was on my belly. I mean, belly. and you're on your, yeah. like, that's what I'm saying. Like, you're on your belly. You've got the, you got the snake catchers, mm-hmm. and it's out in front of you. But now, like, it's not easy to go from here to spin around to hand the snake off right. to somebody else. Yeah. Without it getting closer to you. Mm-hmm. It's, it's sketchy. It's, there, there's been a lot of jobs that, are, are similar to that, but that one just takes the cake. But, yeah, there are a lot of jobs that I go in and go, oh, this is going to suck. Are but, you going under the houses, or are you the top guy? He's He's gone under houses gone with under me. House. Well, the ones that he can fit under. <laughs> I'd, keep, <laughs> I'd keep eating if I was you. But he, he does more of the, the big country serpentarium stuff, but he does, he does help me on occasion on with, snake with removals. jobs. Yeah, we went and did one in Roby last, last week, wasn't it? Yeah, I think so. Um but yeah, it's he does more of the big country serpentarium stuff. And so, if people want to come see your stuff, how do they get a hold of y'all? Yeah, where's the serpentarium? At? Or are they allowed to come see you? You do not want people to come. Yeah, we we definitely want people to come. It's uh, uh, facebook.com slash big country serpentarium, yeah. and we do private tours only. Uh, so we we'll, we can you can have up to eight people. We do we have had schools and stuff come through. Mm. It's just it's it gets too chaotic yeah. for one to two people. To, you know, we, we, we go around and we're educating these these kids and people as, as we kind of move through. So, yeah, we do it for usually up to eight people. If there's nine, it's not a big deal. It's ten. But if you say, hey, I need, you know. So 20, 20 for people, a classroom, it's not happening. We'll do it, but we just, we. Could you take them through in waves? 
10 yeah, kids that's, here. Yeah, that's generally what we try to do. If, you know, they can go eat a sandwich or have a picnic or whatever, and then we'll get through half, then we'll come back and do the so other. So what do you do? You start them out at one point? Like, how's what's the tour like? It's, I guess you can explain. Yeah, it's it about 45 more. minutes long, although I tend to talk a lot, so it goes over. But um, usually we'll bring them through. We'll show them all the the habitats of the snakes and um, go through all the different species that we have there. And we'll bring out, depending on the, you know, on the group, we have to feel the group. You know, if you have a bunch of young kids that are kind of, you know, running around and stuff, we, we don't typically bring out venomous snakes in that confined location. Uh, but we'll bring out a bunch of non-venomous snakes and um, they'll get to touch them, ask questions. Um, they can get fairly close. I mean, our exhibits are, you, they can walk right up in, in front of them and look at the, the many species of rattlesnakes and, and venomous snakes that we have. Um, we usually try to uh, feed some of the animals so they can observe some feeding behavior. We have an alligator there that they're allowed, a small alligator that they're allowed to, to handle as well. Um, and we have a couple of, if it's a warm day, we have some tortoises mm -hmm. um, that they also can feed, some stilcata tortoises. Then we also do um, outreaches uh, where we go to you. Uh, we've done several of those. Um, or we just do presentations for, like, um, forestry people. Yeah. Um, big, I mean, these are big, you know, on stage kind of situations where we'll bring venomous snakes. Um, and if we're on stage, we can bring them out. Or we have acrylic locking uh, clear enclosures that they can, you know, come up close and look at. Uh, we can transport the snakes to those locations and they can look look at them very closely. Um, and we answer questions and all that stuff. So the the you know the end goal, obviously, this is in the works for the last four or five years. I think we've been working on this. The end goal would be to actually have a facility that is open to the public, just like any zoo. Mm -hmm. uh, that they would come in during uh, hours of operation, uh, would come in. We would have a gift shop, and we would have you know exhibits where they can walk around um, and presentations where they can learn about these snakes. Uh, and their importance in the ecosystem and, and learn about why, you know, they are important to have around. Um, I think you need to check it out. I took Let a bu <laughs> tell you something. Now, what I was thinking is if we, we do our TV show next year and we go off-site do some filming, Andy would love to work there for a day, and I could go film and watch him yeah, deal with all these snakes. I, I would not like oh, to work there. I would, love to, I would love to take a tour of it, but I would not want to work there. I'm not handling snakes. I took a biology class in college, and they had a, a, a rattlesnake there in a, in a cage, and um, we got all excited because you get to feed the rattlesnake. Mm -hmm. Drop a mouse in there. We stood around that motherfucker for an hour. Waiting for him to eat? Never did. <laughs> Never did. Came back the next day because it's Monday, Wednesday, Friday. We dropped it in there on like a Monday. We all stand around there, wait for it to do its thing. Mouse is running all over it. Doesn't do anything. Teacher does its lesson. Like, okay, just kind of keep an eye on, you know, if it, if it does it. Nothing. The whole class. Not a fucking thing. Get back there on Monday and the mouse is gone. So it did it sometime, yep. I guess, during... They'll do that on occasion if they're in shed or Son just not hungry. Bitch. They'll just become what I call best friends with the food that they're supposed to eat. Yeah. They'll, and they'll either cower in a corner or eventually eat it, but um, that snakes for you. Yeah, I'm not, <laughs> I'm not. I'm not. God bless you guys. I appreciate what you do. You've given me a different insight on snakes, and I appreciate what you've done and what you're doing and going to get snakes. But my ass is not working on a snake place, and I am not going to go on a tour of one. But I would like to kind of see what you did. So I would take Andy and my grandkids and let them go do it, and I'll sit in the parking lot. So which one okay. did you say was always cranky? The King Cobra yeah. is cranky all the time? <laughs> yeah, that's what you want to mess with. But the you, you what was the other one? The Mamba, you said they're just kind of sporadic and flighty. And yeah, the Mambas are the... When we first got the big King Cobra, he he didn't seem too bad. He was... You could you could deal with him, but for whatever reason, I think since we have his girlfriend next door, um, we have a partition in the middle of their enclosure, so that's how we introduced them for breeding. Otherwise, they would eat each other. But oh, we, really? Oh, yeah. If they weren't, so like you have to, it's just got to be for breeding. Yeah. How do you know when she's in ready to be bred? Get lucky, really. You can kind of see some ovulation things, so some swelling around the latter part of her body, and then. We've got some information from a few different zoos that have successfully bred them, so we kind of had a timeline. We are you watching them the whole time to make sure that they're not oh, yeah. aggressive to oh, one yeah. another? Oh yeah, and so we also feed them. They very just well. fight. 
they fight? If, well, if, if you if, didn't, if the were, timing was off, if they weren't was banging not, each other, they're going to be fighting. The male is so much larger than the female okay. that it wouldn't be. It would, so he would kill her fight. pretty fast. I would yeah. think so. Well, and then what do you do then? Like if they're if you got a snake fight on your hands, a rodeo. Really? It's fixing to get dicey. Yeah. <laughs> we, we're both there usually observing, especially when the first introduction happens. Yeah. Because you know king cobras are snakier, so that's what's sketchy about them is that we want to make sure that he understands since he's bigger than her that she is, you know, a female that he's got to breed with, not. Another snake to eat. So right? he doesn't play well with others. Yeah. So king cobras are normally, obviously, they're solitary, just like most snakes. So we feed him very well, but we'll see behavior, like you said. The female will swell up. She's ovulating. The male will kind of pace around and look at that partition because he can smell. He knows what's right. going on there. And then we're like, we have a date, which is usually January 11th, where this kind of goes down. And then we say, okay, well, she's they're both well fed. They're both behaving like they should for, for breeding behavior for a snake. And then we pull the part, but it can go wrong, just like anything. So we're there with snake hooks, making sure we have to separate them or whatever. But um, I'd rather separate two fucking three hundred pound men in a bar fight than have to go in to <laughs> well, separate yeah. those king yeah, cobras. That, I'm pretty interesting. Mm, there ain't no way. In there. <laughs> so like, you, so you'll notice, like they kind of become, they notice each other more mm -hmm. whenever well, they're, yeah. whenever that time. Now, will she come in to heat, for lack of a better term, once a year, or is it a couple times a year? So um, this is the second time that we will breed the king the first time was unfortunately not successful uh the eggs didn't make it but this time it looks like it's really good but um why did what what, what went wrong the first time you think first time mom she's oh. just the first that was we bred her for the first time um it's not unusual for for clutches for first time snakes to be not great uh like she dropped even more eggs this time than last year so as they mature um Physically, they do better with their breeding and stuff like is that. Is her behavior different whenever she has eggs on the ground? Oh, yeah. She gets a lot more defensive. Really? Nesting. So uh, king Cause... cobras are the only snake in the world that builds a nest. It's actually kind of cool to see that process, the snake using its neck to make a mound. Um, so we set up a nest box. She was gathering the leaves in there, the mulch. And they get very defensive. I mean, this is her clutch of eggs. And so she'll go in there and lay in the wild. She would make this huge mound, go inside and lay her clutch of eggs. And she'll sit in there. Um, usually in the wild, it's it's triggered along the monsoon in Asia where it's much more humid and, and warm. And food is more available. So when the babies hatch, they can eat. And uh, she'll sit there and guard that clutch. And if anything approaches it, she'll come out to defend them. Um so they they're very defensive, which is very unusual for for a cobra or any snake. Mm -hmm. Again, it's it's said to be the smartest, the most intelligent snake in the world. Of course, it's not gonna, you know, do algebra, right? <laughs> it's smart for a snake. Its behaviors are smart, you know, building a nest. But she'll guard them, and then typically what happens is right before they're about to hatch, uh, she leaves. And then the babies hatch, and then they just, they're on their own. Um, but, yeah, the male plays no part in it. His part is to just breed and, and leave. So what, so let's say she hatches her egg, her eggs hatch, and this year is going to be great. You have to remove her and then remove all the baby cobras then? So we already, we've already done all that. We've already done that. Oh, you're so incubating them? We're incubating okay. them um, because this isn't, obviously, Asia. It's Texas. It's dry. It's right. dry. The, the, I mean, this time of the year... You know, the weather's all over the place. They have to be incubated in a certain temperature or else we're going to have a lot of loss, right? So obviously we want to optimize our, 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 the, you know, the eggs hatching. Um, and in the wild, obviously, they die. I mean, they're all not going to hatch. It mm -hmm. floods. It's the yeah. monsoon. You know, nature is what it is. But here we want to make sure that obviously they do the best. We, we do the best we can. And we had uh, a friend of ours who's, who also helps works with us uh, make an incubator, uh, really cool incubator and we have them incubating and in, in there it'll probably take about 50 to 60 days uh for them to hatch since they were first laid but obviously in nature she would guard them they would hatch uh but in the serpentarium once we knew um he ended up calling me and, and nathan called me and told me hey they she laid her eggs mm -hmm. um he lifted up the lid saw her in there with a clutch of eggs um i showed up later on and we had the fun of getting her <laughs> off the eggs 
Yeah, um, I bet that was a rodeo. Yeah, we actually have a video uh, of it on our on our Facebook page and and some uh, some quick. pictures as well. And, when, uh, when did y'all? When that did was that like happen? Like three, four Sorry. days, five days? No, it's been longer than that now. I don't know. Just look up Big Country yeah. Serpents Area. Look at Big Country Serpents Area. Yeah, I just didn't it's know how far I needed to go. No, this you don't have to be go one far. of the most recent ones. That's one if of the most not, recent. Should be the last. Can't one. imagine it's going to look and lit up at a damn king cobra. Yeah, and she just mm. hoods up, you know. Oh. And so mm. we had to get the nest box out. That that's her. That's her right there. So she built that nest right she there. She built that. Yeah, we put some of it in there, but she drug most of that material. Um, from in from inside her her enclosure into that box. Read that first comment. Let me know if babies are available, please. Got it. Tom's lost his damn mind. <laughs> <laughs> and so people... she is guarding actively guarding a clutch of thirty. No, One. sorry, thirty one. Thirty one eggs. Yeah. So you just grab her and then. Just, so just... yeah, we lift her up. So eggs, reptile eggs, are kind of interesting. They're not like bird eggs. You cannot rotate them. Oh. Um. So after we, this is why we had to pull her out. Because she's defensive and she'll just move around and writhe around. She can accidentally rotate those eggs. So we use if you in the video you'll see my hand where I blocked the entryway with a, that's ra- on, a that's rather on, flimsy piece of plastic. Oh, go to the serpentarium. Yeah, that's this is on the snake oh, okay, removal okay, page. Okay. Let me go to the serpentarium. So yeah, if I blocked it and uh, we got the box out, set it on the floor so we had room, and then we lifted her up so she wouldn't drag her eggs. How much she weigh? Uh, not my, not my. I've actually haven't weighed her, but I would say a couple of pounds. Maybe? I think I it's mean, more than that. I mean, I mean the, 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 the male males. weighs a lot more. The male like weighs double her size. I, I don't. Twenty. I've never actually 20, okay. 30 pounds. Thirty pounds. Well, 20, I guess. 30. Here we go. Here but we yeah, go. We go through the whole process of you know literally when he found it. You see the lids kind of lifted up a bit where he checked already, and then Nathan was like, "Gave me a call because I'm pretty sure he's like." I don't so, want to do this by myself. <laughs> so was that was that box in there before, or was that yes. box in there for her to lay her eggs? No. So we had another box very similar. Uh, we removed it, but we wanted it to be more closed in and have a better material that would stay moist. Because if the eggs dry, they'll die. So we wanted to make sure I had a lid on it, so that way we can get the box out. Because we knew we would have to get her out. Is she in there right now? She's in yeah, there right now. Hell. She's in there right Gosh, now. Hell no. You're gonna see. I'm gonna get her out. Mm. Um, so I'm opening the box, and uh, so she's curled in there with her eggs. Um, there she goes. And you can oh, see. Oh shit! She's pissed. Yep. No. That's hell her being defensive. No. You and can see the opening mm. all the way yeah, towards yeah. her head where she entered and put all that material in there. Do you want to work there, Andy? Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. As you see, she's just kind of curled up. She actually did. She wasn't like as. She looks like she's kind of hiding. Yeah, she's kind of. She's she's kind of stayed there. Now she's like, "Mm." no. She was actually not as bad as I thought she would be when I removed her. So, Um, and then I just kind of lifted her up, put her in that red bucket. As you can see, we don't do any of that free handling crap that people do. We right here, it. he's doing something pretty cool. Yeah. It's dotting the eggs. So. so remember that rotation thing I said? Oh, you got So I'm sure. dotting it. So if she rotates those eggs by accident, I know that that's the right direction pointed up. Because snake eggs attach, snake embryos attach themselves to the uh-huh. egg. And so if you rotate them, the yolk uh, will crush the embryo. And so it's very important that we know what's the direction they were laid. Because you see how she's acting? She You've can, lost your damn mind. You're two foot from that thing biting you on your leg. I, I get it. I mean, it's kind of like a forced perspective. I'm a little bit further, but yeah, I'm pretty close. Oh. I mean, someone's got to do the I'm job. I'm nervous I mean, watching. Somebody got to do. <laughs> I am. Ner- I'm telling you right now. Someone I, has oh, a, you can no. see how tall she is. Yeah, she's a. She's I mean, big. I'm not the tallest person. You know, I'm like five eight. Seven but, foot. Is but, she but, yeah. but the male, oh, the, the male is easily. Huh? She's bigger than that. She's bigger yeah. than oh, that. And, and the male's easily much larger than she. Now, is. can she crawl out of that? She can. I'm gonna put a lid on it, so oh, I'm watching. Okay. All right. I'm trying to get her entire body in there, and then I get that lid. Um. You know, it's kind of it has a handle on Look it. Look at her of, looking up at yep. you. She's, hey, she's, 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 she's she she doesn't that, like that I'm messing with her eggs. Put so. that motherfucker right oh, on there. So now, now no. that snake is mm. safely contained, now I can you know work on the eggs. So Nathan has a camera there. So what are you gonna do to the eggs? You just counting them? So I'm gonna now have a, some boxes that are set off to the side that you'll see in a minute, and then we're gonna separate the eggs and then we count them because you can see it's a cluster. Yeah, so it's hard to count when they're all like that together. Um, there's more in the middle, right? They're just clustered together, and the snake was wrapped around them. So now we're going to separate this to a container. There's two containers, um, and then we start to separate them out. And that way, if they roll out of my hand, I know what side they're pointed up, and we lay them in the moss. That's basically sphagnum moss. And then we set that into the, the incubator um, for the name. So you'll see me grabbing them out, laying them in there. 
So about 55 days from now. 50 to 60 days, give or take. Uh-huh. Yeah, you see you, the little dot on there. You're hoping to start seeing. Yep, we'll hopefully start to see uh, pipping. Which is, is she when going crazy snake... in that trash can? She Well, I didn't see her. Um, I'm, she's going, I mean, a little stir crazy now because obviously we took the eggs. They'll, they're not animals that will, you know, sit there for a long time and feel bad that their eggs were taken. Uh, she'll get over very quickly, start eating again. It's not, you know detrimental to her health by any means but she's not happy obviously mm. you and know, then, instinctively i took away her eggs she doesn't know that it's for the betterment of making sure her eggs actually do better and hatch so <laughs> now whenever they do start hatching y'all will have to separate those cobras from yeah each other? every one of them because that's they'll gonna start, be fun because be- they'll start fighting eating at a young age. each other so that's 31 separate containers of king cobras that we will have to feed and clean as individuals because we cannot house them together because they eat each other. Yeah. What? What? Well, in the wild, of, what happens? In yeah. the wild, they will hatch out of that nest. Um, king clo- cobras, especially babies, are climbers. And actually, baby king cobras look <clears throat> nothing like the parents. They are almost. They're striped. They're black and yellow. They almost look like a kind of like a king snake, California king snake. Um, so that's their warning colors, and they climb up into the trees. That's their instinct because Asia is full of things that can eat them, including other king cobras. So they climb up, and they there's me putting the female back, and then basically what they use what they do is they hunt little snakes in the wild on uh, until they get bigger. But like I said, a lot of those are gonna die. I mean, a lot own, of those babies. babies Look right there. There's the that's python. our big python, our on biggest the snake. Yep, yeah. the males to the left of that. So you can see that little, barely that handle, that partition. So yeah, that yeah, yeah, yeah. I opens. That. I can slide that and introduce the male to the female. Um, but he's to the left. We don't permanently keep them together. We only put them together for breeding purposes. So <laughs> you can see how long, that's the longest venomous snake in the world is the king cobra. So, and this is a small animal. She might not look small to you, but it's compared to the male. Um, you can see she's turning around. She's like, Hey, you know, hey, my, my eggs. <laughs> close this motherfucker. So close it with, close it with your hand. Hell close it, God, close it with your little, uh, when you guys, you guys got some balls. I appreciate it with your handle. Next we appreciate time. y'all being on here. It's been a very educational podcast. I'm nervous as shit right now, but just watching that video makes me. Woo. So what will the, what will the King Cobra do whenever, like in the wild, is there any sort of like cleaning that they have? Like you, you mentioned you have to clean them. Oh yeah. I mean, it's a daily thing when you have over 200 snakes, they're all going to, you know, crap and do their thing. Um, so we have to clean them every day. There's something. But I mean, like, as far as like, whenever they climb out of the egg, are they going to have, like, are you going to have to clean them right as they get out of the egg to get some of that embryo shit off of them? No, I mean, naturally the moss will absorb that. Oh, right. Um, they'll hatch and all that stuff, that leaking, all that will be absorbed by the moss. They'll, I mean, they're not going to eat each other right away. There's a grace period in there. Snakes don't eat right away when they're born. They typically go right into a shed um, so they're probably all going to be, you know, this, I would love to see that happen. Obviously, how probably. Big, you guys, how big are we thinking that they're going to come out? Um, Probably about, I've seen baby that kings. That big already? Yep. They're already <laughs> that big. They're very long. They're not fat. Um, They're kind of lanky because they climb, like I said, up in the trees. But, you know, hopefully we'll open up a bin and there'll be a bunch of baby king cobras in there. And uh, What's this right here? That's a Western Dimeback rattlesnake giving birth. They give live birth? They give live birth. So king cobras lay eggs. And most vipers, there are a couple of exceptions to the rule, just like everything in life. Um, they give birth to live young. The Bushmaster is an example of one that does not. But that's a rattlesnake. That would be a, a Western Diamondback. So one of the, obviously, our native species. I'm crawling. And I'm so way. that's I'm how so they're nervous. born. We managed to catch. I walked in there, and I think I managed to catch her right as she was dropping her babies. You can see to the left, she already has a couple that were born. Ugh. So they're mm-hmm. born in that embry- embryonic sac. And then when she lays or she drops them, um, they'll use their head and they'll pop their head out, take their first breath. So, um, and they'll kind of stick around with mom for a bit. They'll go through that first uh, shed and then they kind of, you know, they're on their own. They, mom doesn't offer them food. They catch their own food. You can kind of see a little bit, just like any animal. There's some stillborns or yeah. what we call slugs. So there's like a yellow-ish kind of egg-looking thing, and that's just... Uh, oh, that's her right there. Yep. And so oh, when snakes boy. give birth, they kind of go into a trance. It's our kind of a reptile I thought her, thing. I thought that was her head right there. That <laughs> no, her head's her, all the way is, yeah, to the right. That is not her head at all. Yeah. Well, my my hand's pretty close there. Could, w- yeah. Would she strike you in this no, vulnerable like, state? So like I said, when reptiles lay eggs or give birth, they tend to... 
that short period of time, turtles especially, they go into a trance. Mm -hmm. Kind of just like, kind of just days out. <laughs> you could kind of see her just yeah. sitting there. Yeah, but again, um, kind of chill. You know, after that, she would snap out of that. You know, but as long as you move slow and deliberate, deliberately around her, she's not gonna usually care. I'm obviously not gonna test the limits by sticking my hand in there, mm. but you know, I'm just gonna observe. You know, this behavior. You know, to catch that process is very yeah. rare. You know, I'll walk in and we have babies. That's cool. You know, but to see her actually dropping. Her and babies then, and catching that moment is pretty. How weird. how soon how soon do y'all let her have her babies before you're removing the baby snakes? Well, we'll let her drop everything. Obviously, we don't want to disturb that process. So once we see that she's dropped all her babies and she'll lose a lot of weight. I mean, you can tell because when snakes are gravid or pregnant, they're super fat, and you can see they kind of lose that body weight. Um, and I'll know she okay. She dropped everything. Um, and usually a couple of days, you know, that just depends, you know, how slow the size of the enclosure. Sometimes we'll remove them immediately if we feel they're too crowded in there or we'll leave them for a couple of days and then we'll separate them out. Uh, just, it just depends on the situation and how, the snake we're dealing with. When do they need their first meal? Usually about after they shed is when we eat, when we offer them food. So the whole process of shedding will take a week or two and we don't even think about offering food until after that. They also have a lot of retained yolk, mm -hmm. I mean, from being born in their body. So they have a slit. But you can't see it on that video. They were, you know, where they have an umbilical, you know, which seals up and all that stuff. Um, so they'll have some yolk and stuff like that, you know, it's in their body still. So they're not going to eat right away. Son of a bitch. This has been an interesting podcast. Oh, um, <laughs> nervous as hell. <laughs> One last question before we get out of here, because it's been over two and a half hours. Um I've always heard that baby rattlesnakes have more potent venom than adult rattlesnakes. Is this true, or is that another horseshit thing? Horseshit so, thing. Horseshit for the, thing? For these Western diamonds. For those. Yes. There are is some. There are some exceptions. Exceptions, just like anything. So here's the thing. There's some like the Southern Pacific rattlesnake that their venom composition when they're young is more toxic, and it is because of what they're eating. So... A lot of these snakes, when they're born, you saw the size of that snake. It's very tiny, right? Mm -hmm. It's not to eat a rat. It's not going to eat a mouse. It's too small. So they're eating a lot of reptiles in their diet, which are mainly probably going to be lizards. Lizards are reptiles. They have a very slow metabolism. So for venom to circulate through a reptile, for damage to be done, it takes longer because the way their body mechanics work and their metabolism, it takes longer. Lizards are very fast, so if this baby snake encountered prey in the wild and it bit a lizard and it ran away a mile away, well, it's not going to find it. It's gone, right? So it has to be fast acting. So it's designed to affect this lizard um, very, very quickly, so it's mm -hmm. more toxic in certain snakes. However, this is where it becomes a really of a myth. Is it more dangerous? The answer is no, because the size, right? If I get, you know, let's, a Southern Pacific... Adult Southern Pacific rattlesnake bit me. The amount of venom that is injected on in that snake would be a lot more. There's a lot more venom in there <laughs> as opposed to a small baby rattlesnake. Once they start to get older, again, depending on the species, then they're geared more to eating mice and rats, squirrels, whatever it is that or rabbits or whatever that they're eating out there in the wild. So um, the size alone, I'd, I'd take a bite from a baby Southern Pacific any day as to an adult because the adult is still going to be dangerous because it's bigger, has more venom. Um, so even though in certain species the venom might be more toxic in babies, it's still not something I'm going to compare with an adult that has a lot more venom. Volume, volume, volume. 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 All about volume. Well, we sure appreciate you guys yeah. being on Thank here. Thank you all very yeah, much for, for coming us. up here. Oh, well. Thank it's, you. Been a, it's been an awesome time, very uh, educational. and Hopefully a lot of people I, in Abilene I, will come still, out and see you all in some of the local schools. Yeah, yeah, that'd be great. Yeah, that'd be awesome. We, we appreciate y'all having us. Keep yeah. keep honking. Uh, Absolutely, we appreciate we it, guys. Y'all be guys. safe. Thank, Thank you. Bye. All right, we love you. Bye, and watch for deer. Busy week next week. Thanks for listening to us. See you. Bye. God dang, I'll never be. Please, please go check out all of our sponsors. And if you're Ab if you're in the Abilene area, go check out the uh, Big Country Serpentarium. Uh, got a lot of cool things going on. Boss Shot Shells, Pacific Calls, use our promo code BHP25, MLR Graphics, Dive Bomb Industry, Dirty Duck Coffee, Shin Gear, Looking Glass Podcast, Lucky Duck, Ducks Unlimited, 
Double T British Kennels, Mallard Bay, Mossberg, Stanford Outfitters, Outfoutdoors, Pesties, and Hemp Hill Farm. Promo code BHP.